3 billion, billion views. views with a B. With a B. A Bezos B. People, I hear, and I get mad initially because I'm like, what the hell am I doing? But then yeah. they're just like, Battle Bus guy. Yeah. I get approached in gyms like, hey, you're the Battle Bus guy? I'm like, yeah, I have a name. Do you know my name? They're like, no, but can I get a picture? I'm like, well, sure, I guess. Yeah. My name's Austin. This episode is sponsored by Ream Medical. Every veteran deserves respect, competency, and clarity when pursuing a disability claim. Of course, we all know the frustration is much more common. If you're looking for a better path and documentation that strengthens your disability rating request, start with our sponsor, Ream Medical. Ree's team of professionals work with a network of experienced physicians, and they've already provided meaningful medical evidence for more than 25,000 veterans. And while they can't guarantee what the VA will decide, 95%, let me say that again, 95% of their clients reported receiving a disability rating of 70% or higher. That's because when you connect with Remedical, they take the time to explain your options before you pay for anything. Free consultations. So don't give up on a stall process or settle for an unfavorable decision from the VA. Cut through the frustration with accurate medical evidence and a streamlined approach that allows you to pursue your claim confidently. Head over to remedical.com, that's Romeo Echo Echo Medical.com to book your free consultation. Check out our link in the podcast section for more details. And we're back to another episode here with my good friend, one of my favorite people, and one of the best things to come out of the Navy since ships, Austin Alexander. Thank you very much. Did you write that? That was really smooth. I wrote it right here. Wrote that was right really here. good, right off the dome. I wrote it right here, too. In your heart? In my heart. Thank you very much. Center mass. Thank you. I'm excited you're here. You're one of my favorite people. Um, you're one of the most known people I've ever been around. Hanging out with you in public is kind of a, kind of a lot. Like, when we get getting yelled oh, it's, at. It's, it's not, not bad. Good. It's just people like... Hey, Paul. Getting yelled at, yeah. They're like, hey, I hate your videos, dude. I'm no. like, oh, thanks, man. No, dude, we were at uh, MCON, uh, the military convention in Vegas, and um, there were there were a few people who would be like, are you the cardboard guy? And I was like, cool, that's whatever. But, like, everywhere we went, every guy with a fade, like, looked at you, and they're like, hey, are, hey, are you the, are you the, how many pull-ups can you? Yeah. How many, like, literally every single. They don't know my name. They just say, are you the pull-up pull guy? I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I guess. Yeah, but before you were the pull-up guy, there's so many different things we can talk about. I want to talk about your story, and my belly's full, and my heart is mm -hmm. grateful from you coming over last night cooking on the Traeger. Might be the best steak ever. I mean, everyone in the house, the wife, the kid, everyone, top marks. Thank you. Thank you very much. You know, humans have been gathering and feasting for hundreds of thousands of years, and it's ingrained in me to cook for people and i love to do it especially yeah, steaks i got i got the wife the wife christy i can say her name she was um she's like don't make him cook and i was like no he like this is something we've been looking for we've talked about this mm -hmm. and then she said that and then she's like this is way better <laughs> i've only i'm barely learning the traeger and how to do it but you've got it down to a science it's what we're going to do moving forward the crust the salt mm -hmm. the pepper it's 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 next level it's it's a process it's a you know i've messed up hundreds of hundreds of dollars of steaks dude these were not mess ups. These were incredible. I had it this morning, little eggs. I'm probably going to eat some later. Good. Um, you know, you're staying with us forever. Like, mm -hmm. I've already been told that you're more than welcome to stay whenever open invitation. Thank you very much. You really impressed everyone. You did, you did great. Thank you. You did great. Yes. Yeah. yeah. As you always do great. But before you start doing great on the internet, tell me about Austin. Tell me about Double A, where he starts. That's my nickname I gave to him. Double A, Austin Alexander. I, I grew up in small town Florence, Alabama, about an hour and a half south of here. Yep. We used to drive across the border when I was like 15, 16 and buy tobacco. You know, those are the type of friends that I had. Great friends, great, great times. You had to, uh, what, in, in Tennessee? Yeah, Tennessee. Just over the to, border? To Tennessee, yeah, yeah. They didn't, they didn't ID you? Well, we knew a few people over there that wouldn't check IDs. Yeah. And, yeah. Those are the days. That was, that's my whole life story, just driving across the border and, <laughs> um, to Alabama and Asheville and getting tobacco. Dude, there was a there was a place in Memphis we knew where they didn't check IDs for anything, mm. and it was a very well known spot. I'm not gonna put a, put them on blast now, but you do have those spots when you're coming up for sure. Yeah. Now it's like 21. There's no chance you're getting. It used to be 18 yeah. for tobacco and stuff. Now well, it's just not happening. Well, I don't do it now, regardless. So yeah, I've moved past that. I thought it was a cool thing to do. I I grew up in a very small, very small town. I think of like 5,500 people. It's called St. Florine. It was actually kind of outside of Florence. 
I went to high school at Wilson High School, same high school as a lot of you guys know him as Donut Operator, yeah. Cody. And I graduated in 2010 with 90, 93 people. And that's crazy, right? <clears throat> that y'all both went to the same school. Mm-hmm. You're both a big part of my life. And I met y'all's principal at the range day we just did. Um, this will, There's a lot of time in between these, but the coolest teacher I've yeah, ever met. He's a good Les, old boy. Abstin, yeah. Yeah, Les Abstin mm-hmm. showed up with a visor. Like it, it's if I were going to cast, if I was going to cast, you know, a principal in a high school in Alabama, that's exactly him. what I do. Yep. He's up there and he's like roll tide, and I'm like hell yeah, dude. <laughs> like he he's been there for a minute. He moved up, I believe. He was the um, he was a teacher and then some type of coach and the counselor, and then mm-hmm. he moved up to assist, assistant principal, and now he's principal. Yeah, he's running it. Yep. I might go down. I might enroll just to be down there. Come on down. Dude. Come on down. I'm so sold on it. I'm, I, I long for a slower pace of life. Mm-hmm. I long for it. So. Was it like yeah, that down there growing up? What was it? Slow pace? Yeah. Well, at the time when I, when I lived in Alabama, I didn't know any different. You know, I didn't hardly travel. The first time I flew was going to boot camp in 2013. Mm-hmm. I was 20 years old when I flew on a plane for the first time. It was pretty... Looking back, it was pretty mundane. Like I had great friends, great friend group, really supportive. I was fortunate enough to be, to be in a friend group that that didn't do drugs, that didn't drink a mm-hmm. whole lot. That, mm-hmm. you know, back back then there was a whole lot of groups that that would do that and do hard drugs and just get drunk and get DUIs and underage drinking, like all these things. I was very fortunate to have a, a friend pod of like six or seven great people who were, you know, they were in the church and they had great families. They were raised right. And so that's, that's a, it was a big part of my childhood being able to grow up and, and become, I think, a solid human being. Yeah. yeah. You definitely, you definitely are. But like, what, what did your parents do? Like what? My parents met at a skating rink. They both loved to skate. My dad loved, loves disco music. What? And For real? Yeah. Old man yeah. A? He, my dad can dance. My dad loves a karaoke and dance. Like I think that's where I got my confidence from is is my dad. Like he don't care about what anybody's saying or doing or what they think about him. He's just in his own zone. And just out there rising up your mom. <laughs> like on the skate. up my mom is what the what the kids say nowadays. And, yeah. And they got married. I was born in nineteen ninety two. Yeah. And we lived in I believe it was a uh, yeah, three bed, one bath. Had my brother. My brother was born in ninety one, and you're old. He's older. He's older. He's yeah. fifteen months older yeah. than me. And I grew up my whole childhood. Everybody was saying, oh, "How you know? What's the age difference between you and your brother?" I said fifteen months, and mm-hmm. they're like, "Wow, your parents got busy, didn't they?" <laughs> I didn't understand it until yeah. I was like, you know, ten or eleven. Now my my brother and I are about that close. It's also a very weird thing to say to a child. It is. Yeah, I'm yeah. not sure why, <laughs> like, why people told me that. Maybe like. They'd say the exact same thing. I think it's like 18 months or whatever. I, I can't remember yeah. off the top of my head. But I just remember being like, I'm eight. <laughs> like, why are you talking to me like this? <laughs> Listen, I'm eight years old. Yeah. You shouldn't be saying that to me. Yeah. yeah. You should go talk to adults, like, mm-hmm. all the time. It's weird. Yeah, we, we grew up in the church, had a, a very supportive grandparent, uh, two very supportive grandparents on my mom's side. I never met my dad's parents because mm-hmm. they're, I think cancer runs my dad's family. His, mm. his mom passed away of cancer. His dad passed away of cancer. His grandma and his grandpa passed away of cancer. And, wow, this is really depressing. I should, I should, no, I should start no, off on no, a higher dude, note. No. I just, so during this, this podcast, I'm going to mention a, a lot of things that I've never t- spoken about before, just so yeah. you know. Uh, I'm giving you the, the long version because I, I love you. You're a, great, you're a great guy. I love you too, man, and I'm honored. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, uh, household income was probably, you know, at, at times, maybe thirty, forty thousand dollars. My mm-hmm. dad was a mechanic. Mm-hmm. Uh, he kind of switched from from job to job. He started out in fundraising for a local fire departments, mm-hmm. volunteer fire departments, and then he became a mechanic. And he had he didn't have a degree, but he had certifications in, in diesel, diesel um, mechanic, heavy, mechanics. Uh, was it heavy? Heavy operators. Heavy operator, and, yeah. yeah. And he would always. Growing up, he was a farmer. He was a worker. He loved to stay busy, and he stayed busy all the time. He was. Uh, he, we had seven acre, seven acre garden. We planted things like watermelons, beans, peas. I can remember being out there when I was six or seven. Shucking peas? 
Yep. Hole in peas. Yeah. And we would split the top, no, yeah. run them. our yeah. thumb through it, and manually um, hole. Yeah. Well, he called them hole. Yeah. Hole these peas. And we yeah. would sit there and watch a movie while the whole family had just bushels and bushels of peas. And we would just put them in a pan. And all you would hear is just beans hitting that tin pan for like three or four hours. And then we would go cook them for dinner. I grew up on on very fresh food, never, never went out to eat hardly. And it was always potatoes and peas, potatoes and peas almost every night for supper because we got them from the garden. That sounds awesome. Well, at the time, I was like, oh, this is boring. Like I want, I would see, you know, my friends would go out to eat on a Sunday or whatever. And I would just be like, I want that food. Yeah. And I mentioned that because it's going to be a very important topic later in the story. Mm -hmm. But I always grew up on garden food. I would go out there and we would bust a a fresh watermelon. Watermelons Mm -hmm. to this day is still my favorite food. And I didn't, I hated gardening. I I, I hated it. Looking back now, I should have loved it because it was a valuable time with my my dad, my brother, my mom. But every single summer, fresh garden. And then during the wintertime, when my dad couldn't garden, he would change people's oil, Mm -hmm. charge them $8. He would give me four dollars he taught me how to change oil we would just dump it in the field right beside the house which i'm pretty sure is illegal and allegedly they would dump it in the field yeah allegedly that's why everything's dead dead now because the years of dumping oil (laughs) behind the barn but uh yeah my mom had a has a degree in business management okay she never really used it she was always in the school system with my brother and i she she homeschooled us from the time we were four and five up until the time we were I th- actually, I think it was only like one or two years that that she homeschooled us. I think I was maybe three or four. Mm-hmm. We were, she was a stay-at-home mom with us. Great mother, great that's, dude. That's great awesome. Mom. I keep saying was. My mom's still living, by the way. She's a great woman. Yeah. And she would always take us to sports and art shows, and like we would paint and we would do all this extracurricular stuff. Like she was going ham as a mom. She made sure we were fed, w- woke up on time, clothed extracurricular activity. She put us in sports at a very, very early age. I was just talking to her yesterday about how I was, I was three years old when she put me in T-ball and I started playing T-ball at the local YMCA, my brother and I. So sports were a massive part of my, my childhood. And while my dad was out working, I was with my brother and my mom playing sports and T-ball and baseball and basketball. And I loved it. I loved sports. That's awesome. Thank you. You reminded me a lot of stuff that I didn't, I haven't thought about in a while. You talk about the garden. My grandfather had a garden, mm. and um, he would go out every morning, and it's the only type of tomatoes I've ever been able to eat are the ones that came out of his garden. You know what kind they were? I can't Romas, remember. Romas, burpees? They were huge. German pinks? I, I, I literally, I wish I knew. Okay. But he would eat them every morning mm-hmm. and drink a cup of coffee, and he would make me a cup of coffee. It was just cream and sugar, like a little <laughs> splash of coffee, you know what I mean? Yeah. But he would eat them every morning. He would eat them like apples. Just like boom, yep. and I remember how sweet they were. I have not found a tomato like that since. Maybe no, I haven't. I'm trying to think. Maybe a, ger- a German pink tomato. They're they're big and they're sweet. It's big and sweet. It was yeah. delicious, just like me. But yeah, that's the truth. <laughs> but we would go out there, and he would pull stuff, and he would talk to me about it and mm-hmm. everything. And he was he don't know, but he was like teaching me like little little things. Yeah, about like. You know, this this is good. It, like it comes from, we'd go on the back porch and he'd be like, okay, go pick up those weeds or whatever. Yeah. You know, and like I remember the first time I saw a snake, he's like, pick it up. And I just like picked it up and grabbed it. And he's like, don't be scared. And I was like, ah! I was like a four-year-old kid like holding the snake yeah. being like, ah. Probably chicken chicken snake. Yeah, just, yeah, just a little rat snake, you know, yeah. no, nothing crazy. But at the time you're just like, ugh. But those, those memories, it's so, it's so uniquely Southern is what I feel too. Mm-hmm. Um... You know, doing activities like, you know, getting peas and stuff like that. I remember doing stuff like that with my grandmother as well. Uh, okay. She would always, she had a big pecan tree and mm-hmm. she grew up um, during the depression. And so she always jarred and preserved her whole life. But one of my favorite memories is her being like, go get pecans. And like, it's all the grandchildren. And we would like take all the bats and balls and everything. We would just throw them at this pecan tree until all <laughs> the pecan down. to knock them down. And it was yeah. the best game ever. Just being mm-hmm. like my cousins and stuff like because you know she would buy us all underwear and socks so she bought everybody every christmas 
but every Thanksgiving and Christmas, she would make you whatever dessert you wanted. And so it was for me, it was like coconut cake, pecan pie, or my oh, favorite. Yeah. My favorite's a chess pie. Chess pie. It's hard to come by. Mm-hmm. Not many people know how to do it. I don't think I've ever had one. It's I don't even know what it really is. It's like an egg cream thing, but it is insane. Mm-hmm. It is insane. I love it. I bet um, you know those Southern cookbooks. They don't play around. They're hard I, to, but you can't find food like that anymore. Yeah, you're you're absolutely right. I mean, it's either like done the same way on Pinterest, but like back in the day, you know, you, you had cookbooks that were passed down. Were, yeah, no, it was huge. She wrote stuff down. It yeah. was a real big thing. Mm-hmm. Um, like honestly, I would walk into traffic right now if someone told me there's a sweet potato pie across the street. I haven't had one in so many years. I'll keep that in mind. No, yeah, you got one in the back of the car. I'll, I'll be there. You ever seen those little uh, sweet potato pies? They sell it like the, the yes. supermarkets. Yeah. yeah, it's it's literally the best thing of all yeah. time. My dad loved them. Those in a honey bun. Uh, you know, it's funny. <laughs> uh, chess pie. What is it made out of? A slice of. I love it. Drive recipes from cheesecake. So you see how it's it's got like a crust on top. Mm-hmm. It's it's got a ton of eggs in it, but it's it's kind of like a. I always say it's like a um, a southern creme brulee. Yeah. It's so good. Vanilla buttermilk chess pie. It's granulated so sugar, vanilla cornmeal, pie crust, eggs and butter. Definitely sounds southern. Yeah, and most people don't get. I mean, most people, maybe most people know it now, but all the, all the stuff comes from like lack of access to ingredients and stuff. So mm-hmm. like, just because most recipes are just from poor people. Yeah. Right. And so like, but I'll never forget like slice. You, and you, it's your grandmother. She makes, she makes it for like a normal size, but you're like a small child and you got like, you're like, I got my own pie. You know, <laughs> this is like core memories moments, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. no, nah, dude, I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to find a cookbook now. Cook, cooking and baking, especially with, with our garden ingredients. I mean, it was a staple. It was, that was what we had to eat. Yeah. Rarely had a protein, rarely, because we had to, you know, buy it or hunt it. Yeah. My, my brother got into hunting when he was probably 10 or 11. He'd go in the local woods right across the street and go shoot a deer. We'd, we'd clean it and, and uh, fill dress it and clean it and have it, have it made up into, into meat. So we ate deer meats, made stews, made especially jerky. Mm. Take it to school, sell bags of it, two or three bucks. Is that when you got your entrepreneurship going? Selling jerky? Not me. My my brother's always had the entrepreneurial spirit as well. So mm-hmm. he would, he, I watched a deer die when he went hunting one mm-hmm. time and it kind of messed with me. I was like, oh, that's not cool. And then. It's a lot. It is. Especially as a, a kid, you know, what that deer staring you in the eyes, slowly bleeding out. And you know, it's, I mean, it's, he, he killed a lot of does. Yeah. So I imagine it had babies at some point or. That's how it works. Yeah. Yeah. And. I wasn't much of a hunter at all. I would fish like crazy. Fishing's so different. It is, yeah. They, they don't stare you in the eyes as they're slowly dying. I don't believe fish have emotional intelligence either. I think yeah. they have like a lizard brain. Like that's why we're able to trick them with like lures and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. We, fishing was a huge part. I mean, we would go in, in, in the south, like some of y'all people listening from California and whatnot, you probably don't know anything about catfish. Catfish fried catfish man it, that was that was our protein now we're talking yeah now we're talking yep all right i can mess up some catfish so i grew up in memphis hard to find catfish around here well aaron would know and anyone who wants to find out anything at all in your nashville hit up explore nash xplr.nash they're the ones who are telling you the best stuff to do in town but you take some chicken livers. That was what we. My, is that what you use? Yeah, my, oh, for sure. Yeah. My grandfather. He's and like again. I'm I'm young. He mm. taught me all this stuff. There it is. Uncle Bud's up the road. That's good. Um, go but f- you, it's, oh, it's so good. It's we can go there today. Don't mess with me right now. I'm. It's not far from here either. Um, yeah, using chicken livers for for catfish bait. Well, yeah. The so there, so most people don't know catfish are bottom feeders, mm-hmm. right? So you got to get something that'll wait. And I don't think people like. They aren't from the South, don't like catfish because they don't really understand like how good it really is. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's not fun fishing in the sense like you really just, you could be there all day and nothing will happen. Yeah. But go get the livers, cut them up, drop, we drop two lines, put a stick on them and we would just hang out, me and him. And he would just tell me about his day. Just talking, yeah. Just talking, dude. But fishing's such a uniquely Southern thing too, because like my daughters, they love they love to go fishing too. It's mm-hmm. it's harder when you're the dad because all you're doing is baiting and like unhooking. You're doing everything. Yeah, but like they're just they're they're just catching the fish and oh yeah, it's cool. Like, yeah. 
They love it. My, we used to go to a, a place called Town Creek, and there was this big, big, like, I don't know if it was a nuclear plant or, or what it was, what was it, but we would just fish right outside. Yeah. And, and my dad would just sit out there in a lawn chair, bring three or four rods, yeah. throw a cigarette in, and we used to wrap our liver in pantyhose because it kept longer. That's, okay. That was a trick my dad used, and he would That's just... That's smart. He would just cast it out, toss in a cigarette, and just yell at my my me and my brother, go cast out over there, go, yeah. you know, because yeah. he was wanting catfish too to eat. Yeah, yeah. And we would come back with eight or nine, three or four or five-pound catfish, and my dad would just sling them out, chop the heads off, skin them, fillet them, and go give them to my mom. We'd throw some flour on them and fry them up and have them for dinner alongside peas and and potatoes mm. from the garden. That was uh that was a weekly thing, almost every Saturday, Sunday. Have you ever been noodling? I have never been noodling. I want to go. Hannah Barron, she's in Alabama. Yeah. I, I've met her. I haven't have you met her? I've not met her. I've she's, spoken to her a few times. She's very mind. she's very, very kind, but like she's I don't know how tall she is, but she gets catfish as big as her. Yeah. She can't be over five feet tall. Mm. Which is the scariest way to catch catfish. You just put your arm in a hole, and then it eats your arm because yeah. it thinks it's food, and then you curl it up, mm -hmm. and it's you know it's it's just down in there, like fifty to like I think some of them get up to like a hundred pounds. They're huge. A lot of people don't know that like when catfish get that big, it's because they're old and mm -hmm. the meat is really tough. So I don't think people really noodle to eat. They just no. do it for a thrill. Yeah, I mean it. It does look exciting. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm gonna try and do it. Just be like, you should try. I mean, definitely an experience. What my town in Florence was built off the Tennessee River, mm. and it's you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of feet deep. And I heard stories from a bunch of friends of mine where they would, you know, the big thing was working at TVA and working yeah. at Browns Ferry, all these big industrial plants where yeah. I'm from, and they would go weld at the the bottom of these bridges, and they would say they see the sunlight, and then all of a sudden it would go dark for three or four seconds, and then it would come back on. But they looked up and they said there's catfish as big as cars swimming above their heads while they were down there. Oh, I believe it. Yeah. Catfish I, keep growing. Dude, I believe it because it, in Memphis, there's there would always be some type of horrible thing happening where um, an airplane would miss the airport or something mm -hmm. or something would – somehow they wind up in the Mississippi <clears throat> River. I remember there was this plane, this doctor overshot it, storm, whatever. He, him and his wife were in it. Nothing. Right, gone. Months later, they find like parts of the plane in a catfish's stomach, and like, and the Mississippi and the other parts were like in the Gulf, but yeah. it had just eaten all of it, and That's it was crazy. like a two hundred pound animal, mm -hmm. like it's like a bull, basically that just sits on the bottom of the of the river, mm -hmm. and you can't see anything, and there <sighs> can't see it. There's no way to to fish them out because nobody has things that heavy. So no, they're like a just legends. Yeah, down there. I wouldn't be surprised if that's where the Loch Ness is. It's just a big old catfish. It might be. Or something I, like that. I tell you, I'd rather swim in an ocean than a river I feel any the, day. I, I feel the complete opposite. Really? I feel the complete opposite. We take the kids to the creek not far from the house. Like, I can see it. I can get my feet in there. I know what's in the creek. But that's a creek. Yeah, you're right. You're talking about like a river that's The maybe Mississippi River, people go missing. You don't mess with that. Yeah. And like, it's dark. They, had, and they have whirlpools and it just sucks you down to the bottom. Yep. And then if you're lucky, you come back up. Like there was always these stories of like so-and-so's dad was, you know, he was running a barge or whatever and old boy went over the side and that was it. Mm -hmm. Like that's more terrifying. Like yeah. that river's been there forever since the dawn of time. It's it's dark. Like you can't see the visibility is like half of a foot in front of you. Yeah. So if you feel something in a river, like I've heard legends of river monsters that were twice as scary as anything in the ocean. Yeah. And you know that's what Jaws is based off of? A river, um, ri what do you mean? Not a river monster. Jaws is based on a true story of a bull shark swimming up into this river in New Jersey, I believe it is, mm. and attacking people. People are like, oh, you know, sharks can't do it. But this bull shark was like, like somehow finding oxygen in the fresh water and like just started eating people up. And that's what they based Jaws on. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Golly. Yeah, those, I'd. I believe in river monsters. I mean, just because I've I've heard some crazy stories from close friends of mine, and and I've seen these catfish that just get massive, and and these like we used to going back to fishing, we used to catch a gar all the time. If you I don't know what a gar yeah. is, 
they come in all shapes and sizes. Like they look like a, a lizard and a alligator mix. Yeah. And they have these long snouts with these razor blades on them. Yeah. Those are some freaky animals. Did you ever have like my old man would say stuff like, now listen, listen, boy, you get out there in that water, watch out the alligator guard, they'll, they'll, they'll bite you. And I was like, where will they bite you? He goes, take you right between the legs. <laughs> and I was like, what? And he's like, oh, I'm just kidding. You know, like, yeah. that is a horrible thing. Don't tell me that. Because they do. They look like they look like evolution. Like it's like um, a lizard that just like walked into the water, mm -hmm. but it kept all of its lizard features. Like it's like, do, 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 you know how instead of like going on land, they just go into water? Yeah. They're scary. Yeah. But they are definitely a different. You different never see, of and animal. you never see them in, in, until they're like gnarled up or like they. Because they're, they're on the bottom, too, usually, mm -hmm. I think. I don't know. We always go up to Chattanooga for cheer and stuff, and we'll, we'll hit up the aquarium. Yeah. And it's for the um, – I think it's – what's the Nickajack River or Nickajack Lake, something like that? Chattahoochee. Way down? Okay. No, I don't want to chat. I, I have no clue. Never heard of it. Um. Uh, Aaron, can you pull that up, please? I think Nickajack Lake, right? And oh, yeah. so there's that aquarium's awesome. Also, if you're in Chattanooga, please go see the um, Ruby Falls. Um, not just that, the um, the Medal of Honor exhibit. It's really, really cool. They put it there, and there's a reason they put it in Chattanooga, and you, you'll find out. But there's a Medal, of Honor. but they show all of the stuff that's the Chattanooga Aquarium. They show all the stuff that's in Nickajack Lake. Mm -hmm. It's scary. Weird. It's like sturgeons, how big they are, mm -hmm. or like, oh, they, yeah, that's massive. the, yeah. So that's the Medal of Honor uh, Heritage Center. It's it's really really cool. They walk you through like the history of the medal, all the different people that have gotten it. Um, it's it's beautiful actually. Everyone should go there. Wow, I've been to the aquarium several times on field trips back in in elementary school. Yeah. Yeah. What aquarium? That one? Chattanooga Aquarium. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's cool. It's huge. It's, it's huge. It's huge. And Chattanooga doesn't really get um, as much love, um, but it's – I always say it's kind of like a southern version of, like, Denver because people are always outside in the mountains and mm -hmm. stuff. They're always, like, doing, like, real active stuff. Like, it's Patagonia with a yeah, it's with a southern draw. It's beautiful there. And, like, it's right there on the river, and so many good things are happening there. I love it. You reminded me also of one of my favorite songs when you said TVA. Do you know what it is? Um I'm a head on the TVA song. by Alabama. Yeah. Yeah. Singing. Um, song songs. of the South. Yeah. Yep. Dude, that song makes me cry. My. It makes me cry. That's Daddy a got great a job song. with the TVA, yep. bought a washing machine and a Chevrolet. Like it literally, I'm yep. like. <laughs> That's like, cause you relate to it so much. It's, it's, it's like talking to my, it's like talking to my grandparents. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, they've all since passed, but like, you know, hearing growing up, my grandma in particular in the depression when they're like, we didn't have food. Yeah. Like, and she put money away and like every single day she put something in a per jar and like people forget that. And it was so hard. It was so hard in the South then. And like people forget, but the TVA like changed the entire landscape mm -hmm. of the Southeast. TVA is uh, Tennessee Valley Authority. They run, they create power from the river. Yes. So they're, everything's powered by the TVA. Everything. In the South. And then like, I'm excited to see all the stuff that's happening now. Like in Nashville, there's... Um, an Amazon office that's coming here. There's two fulfillment centers. There's all these different things that are happening. It's like, it's really cool to see, like, I won't say the South get its love, but like so much opportunity come to a place that I, I really do love and care about, you know, because it's, it's unlike any other part of the country, as you know. Yeah. Um, and that's what I love about it. But yep. deep, deep roots in the South. I, I don't really talk about it a whole lot. I, I make jokes online now about farmers only, but. Yeah, it was true. I mean, we were farmers. My dad had a 1946 Massey Ferguson, still has it. Every, you know, every so often he'll change the oil and, and like change a nut or a bolt, but it still runs like. 1946? 1946. I bet it's, I bet it purrs like a kitten. Purrs like a kitten. I think he has two of them now. That's awesome. He, my dad is obsessed with farming equipment, like tillers, tractors, hoes. Like I had a hoe with my name on it. I know that sounds kind of crazy, but. And I'm talking about the hoe that, you know, the, you hoe a garden if you don't know what an actual hoe is. Uh, rakes, like we had them with our, with our names on them because we would just go out there in the garden and, and uh, just, you know, till and landscape and weeds and, and everything. So, yeah, hard work. Why do you think he was obsessed or is obsessed with farming equipment? You say that? I think because it produces an outcome. Yeah. It, for him, it wasn't about, 
you know, we sold a lot of the produce yeah. to local markets and stuff like that. But for, but for him, it was to see the fruits of his, his labor. It, it wasn't about the money. It was it was to to put the work in, and then to be able to eat and and live off of the land. That was what he loved, and he loved the the tools that help him do that. And just like me with cameras now and it's and, your, it's and your equipment tools. now, yeah. just the tools. So I'm obsessed with them. I have. 10, 15 cameras I don't even use. They're just collecting dust, just like my dad's tillers. Yeah. Tools of the trade. Tools of the trade. Yeah. Yep. I mean, it's the first thing you came in here. You're like, look at this. I didn't, you know, and mm. I'm, the only thing I'm, I'm good at is being like, I don't know what that is. Ask, <laughs> ask someone. Mm. But I mean, like, that's why I love this place. It's all the best stuff and we're able to do so much with it. Mm. But, you know, tools of the trade. So you're growing up in the South. You're doing all these different things. You graduate high school, say, it weren't 2010? 2010, yeah. Oh, six was better. Um, yep. yep. It's so funny, too, to think about that you started high school, like, as I was leaving. And I, we were talking about this some last night. But, like, there are all these weird things in our lives, like, like we're weaving and passing. Mm-hmm. And then, like, you're in my house cooking a steak with me, talking to my wife and my kid. And it's just sometimes it's all too much. But full circle, full circle. But it's just the beauty of the internet at its best form mm-hmm. is that you do stuff like that, right? But we're gonna get into that. But 2010, what are you doing? Graduating high school? So yeah, before that, I, I, and this is important for, for later in the in the show. But yeah. I, I started to take an interest in video. I picked up my mom's. She had a you know 720p home cam. I used to love watching home home movies that she filmed us when we were little. And just, I picked up her cam and started making action figure videos. And this was probably when I was, I don't know, 13, 14. And we would just, I would just make action figure videos all, all day and I would plug it up to the TV. And that's where I kind of started learning about tech and, you know, plugging it into a, a box TV. This is before DVD players or before LCD or LED TVs. And I would just, you know, force my parents and my brother to watch what I made. And I'm sure they were kind of like, uh, what do you is have, this? But do you have any of them? I don't. No. I have home videos, but none of the videos that I made, because I'm pretty sure I just deleted them. My mom had <sighs> bought me my own cassette to record and yeah. to delete from. Yeah. There may be some things on it, but that's where I very first got plugged into a, a camera. Yeah. And I just loved it. And I carried that throughout high school and... and uh, more of the subject on the on the production and the entrepreneurial side. I went into this class in seventh, uh, eighth grade. It's called Current Events, and we had a brand new teacher. And she walked in. She said, "I'm gonna be honest. I, I don't really know what we're supposed to be doing in here, but I guess we could read read the paper and talk about local events." And I raised my hand and I said, "Miss Lancaster, what if we produced a show and we fed it out to the whole high school? It was a news a news show." She said, "I love that idea. Who has a camera?" everybody's silent. And I said, well, I have a camera because I was nervous. And she's like, can you bring your camera? And she said, does anybody know how to edit? And I was like, I'll edit. I knew nothing about editing at all. Yeah. And she said, okay, well, you help us produce this show? And I said, yes, I will. So that weekend I went back, got my mom's old camera started messing with it. And I was like, I need a better camera. If I'm going to be bringing this to the school, I need a better camera. So I begged my mom for a 720 feet, uh, 720p JVC Averio. Okay. It was a, like a little action cam that you would, you would hold. And I, I don't know if I said, Hey, I'll do, you know, I'll wash the dishes 10 times or whatever, but she, she bought me that camera. What you traded. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, Traded some Mama. <laughs> exactly, yeah, yeah. and she she bought it for me. Like I said, great mother. She always supported everything I wanted to do or, or tried I bet her she best. saw she saw your affinity towards it. I think so, yeah. especially with the action figure videos. Mm-hmm. What were you What were you doing? Were you like what action figures were you using? I had Frog. I, no, it's Toad from X Men. He was my favorite one. Why? Tell me why. Just because he was this awkward like weird character and he had this green slime that came on him. Yeah. It sounded weird, but he, he, the action figure came with this green slime and I would always put it on other action figures and make it look like he shot the slime over everybody. And then I had Wolverine. I had Captain America. I had lots of Spider-Man action figures and I would just line them up. I would do different voices. I would go to the left of the camera and talk, talk like Toad. And I would go to the right of the camera and talk like Spider-Man. 
and I wish I had some more of those videos. I'll, I'll try to find them. I, I may, I may have. What them. was your toad voice? Can you do it right now? Come on. I don't even remember. It's probably back then. My voice was about six octaves higher. Yeah, for sure. But like, that was probably. It, I don't know. You're like, hey, my name's Toad. <laughs> hey, my name's Spider Man. Yeah, I'm gonna fuck you up. <laughs> well, <laughs> you know. Austin, you can't talk like that. Exactly, mom. It's not me. It's Toad. It's Toad. Yeah. It's not me, mom. It's Toad. Yeah, I'm in character, mom. Don't break the wall. Exactly. And she'd be like, "Well, Toad, you can't talk like that." Yeah. Who's your favorite X Men character? Just let's just go X Men. I don't want to get into this. Fa- favorite X Men, probably. I had a crush on Mystique. When I was little. Well, that doesn't count. That okay, doesn't, okay, okay, okay. I mean, like we definitely go, Wolverine. D- mine too. Wolverine, hands down. Yep. Wolverine. I have so many reasons why, but the main reason, if I look at it, was that he was a warrior searching for peace, mm-hmm. and I've, I've been like, oh, that's, I think that's me. The thing that he is best at is the thing that hurts him the most, right? Like he's best at being Wolverine, but like it takes his toll on him. Mm-hmm. And so I look at it through the abstract. All the rest of them are kind of like whatever. Gambit was cool, right? With the cards. Yeah. yeah. Hey, and he always got the ladies, you know, mm-hmm. and he's cow, cow, cow. You know, Beast is whatever. Cyclops, that just seemed like a nightmare. Not being able to like, always having to have like weird One. goggles and stuff. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But Wolverine, love it. Hey, I think I like him because he's the closest to human. You know, he was kind of like a regular guy. Yeah. And I felt like I, felt like I could relate to him a lot. So I, I would always use my Wolverine. I still have all these action figures in my house, actually. I have comic books and action figures and everything. Uh, going back to the to current events, back in high school, we started producing this show, and I, I learned about editing. I taught myself on Sony Vegas 6.0. That was back in 2008, 2007. Mm-hmm. Just taught myself editing on my on our Windows 95 computer that hadn't been updated in like five, six years. Wow. Super, super slow. But I remember that was, I did not sleep producing that show on a Thursday night, burning it on a DVD for Friday to show the whole school. When I, when I brought that to school, our first episode, I played it from, in front of everybody and I was nervous. And I, I can remember the feeling of when people started actually laughing, it was the best feeling I had ever experienced like that at that point in my life, mm-hmm. being able to create something and and having people watch it and it evokes some sort of emotion, whether funny or happy or sad, it was the best feeling that I have. It was fulfilling for me. Yeah. And it made me want to want to produce more. So we, throughout that six weeks in that class, we, we produced six episodes and it had gotten so big, like everybody was asking me, would stop me in the hallway, Austin, do you have, let me see the current events. I would just let people borrow it. I'm like, hey, just give it back to me next period. And then I got on eBay. I used to shop on eBay. I used to buy Yu-Gi-Oh cards on my mom's account all the time without telling her. Really? Yeah. They were yeah. like 4 or $5 and whatnot, but yeah. I, I, she definitely knew, but she didn't care. Yeah, yeah. And I bought a set of like 100 plastic DVD cases, yeah, yeah. and I printed them off, uh, printed off labels that current events, episode one through six, directed and produced by Austin Alexander. I put a little cool design on there. The S symbol that aliens taught us? Probably something yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah, with, yeah, yeah. I use GIMP, which is, uh, I taught myself GIMP, I taught uh, lots of different softwares. GIMP is like a knockoff Photoshop for those of you who, who don't know. I don't know. And I just was started being creative on a computer, whether editing, graphic, everything. I, I taught myself these softwares and I brought the DVDs to school and I would sell them $10 a pop and they sold like hotcakes. And I think by the by the time that you know, that six weeks had ended, I had sold probably 30 or 40 copies and made three, 400 bucks. And back then you have 300 bucks as a ninth grader, you're rich. Yeah. You could do do it bad now, but then, then you're rolling in it. I was rolling and and I'm pretty sure I paid my mom back for the camera and and bought her like maybe some perfume and stuff like that. Just like saying, thank you. Yeah. Get yourself something nice, mama. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And that was the first taste that I had of, of producing something that I was extremely proud of and exchanging it to people who are willingly wanting to buy it. And it was a great, great feeling. What you're talking about is something that people don't really understand outside of the creative world is that it's definitely an addiction. But what I always say is this, when you're create, when you're making something creative, it's like you have a secret, mm-hmm. right? You have an idea 
and then you make it. You make it in a vacuum, like this is made in a vacuum, realistically. And then you share it with the world. And the moment you go upload or post whatever it is, you burn this CVD, you put it in the, you know, the roll around TV, wherever it is, you're just like, uh. yeah. It that's the most addicting part, hands down, because like all this, I think it's addicting not because of like the um, attention that comes afterwards, but the vulnerability to be like, mm -hmm. I'm sharing this secret with you. Yeah. And I, and until you do it, it's, it's almost impossible to understand, I, I think, but mm -hmm. it's what keeps pulling me back being like, it's, it's a rush. Like you're talking about like waiting for them to laugh. You're like, come on, come on, oh, come on. You're like, I don't, I don't know what type of jokes you're making then. You're like, you know, Auburn thinks he'll beat us this year. Oh, uh, yeah. And you're like, ah, nice, you know? Well, so I should mention I was never in front of the camera. You never, never in front of never. it? Never. I was always behind it. Hated being in front of the camera. I was a very self-conscious guy. And you're, you're talking about being vulnerable. I did not put myself in that position. I was, you know, had breakouts on my face. I used to grow my hair long to cover my ears. I was self-conscious of my ears. What? Shut up, dude. I'm I sorry. Was, I was a very self-conscious guy. I would never be in front of the camera. Mm. Just I didn't value myself. I didn't think that anybody wanted to look at me. I just wanted to produce. And that carried on for a while. And, you know, before all the YouTube stuff started going on, I produced videos for people. I was still never in front of the camera up until I was, you know, 23, 24 years old. Mm -hmm. It was just something that, that, that carried on me, which is another reason why I love YouTube is because it brought me out of my shell. It made me confident myself well and it's it's you you've become something to so many different people myself included and I, Thank I'm you. I'm glad you decided to take that step forward you know because as nicely as I can say this you know I I, I always want veterans to succeed mm -hmm. and I want I want anybody to succeed to be honest but like when there's some of us who take like a a let's just say a step out into the spotlight Leap. I'm always I'm always like please you know Please don't mess this up. Please mm -hmm. don't say crazy stuff being like, you know, well, the, whatever, just like going off the handle on something or being like, this guy, Austin, he thinks he's a Green Beret. That's mm -hmm. all fake. Dude, it's his whole channel. It's a true story. Yeah, it's, it's, it's you know, look at the channel. Um, but it's hard, too, and that's it's a big shift to the second you like. I mean, my whole brand, and I kind of hate the way we're talking about this, but is my whole thing is like I'll build a persona. Mm-hmm. And everyone does that when you're being performative. But like, you know, veteran with a sign is like me turned all the way up is mm. how I look at it. Like I'm just all the good, all the bad. I just crank it to 11. Just And so I'm just like, you know, so I, and there is some freedom in that. But when people start talking about my dumb tattoos or my face or whatever, it is still like, ah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It's, it's very natural. Like humans, like I think naturally we don't want, we don't want attention. We, we kind of fantasize the rush of it, but yeah. secretly when you're first starting out, you don't want to be in the spotlight. You don't want other people to, to be staring at you. It's a very unnatural thing when you first start. Yeah. And everyone thinks they want it till you get it. And then you mm -hmm. get it and you're like, oh, why are people on Reddit talking about me? Yeah. <laughs> why don't these people like work their jobs that they hate so desperately? And like, it's, you know, um, I, I don't know. I've never, to my knowledge... I, I really hope this is the truth. I'd, I've never been like, this guy, Austin, like, but just the way people talk about like bodies or image or different things, I, that stuff kind of makes me up. It doesn't make me upset. It makes me very upset mm -hmm. because like it's the dehumanizing of people that like online that's it's kind of gotten out of hand, but there's more like a reigning in of that because there was too much of it like – Everything was not serious, and then everything was taken too seriously, and now we're kind of coming back to like, hey, if you say it online, there are real-world consequences. And mm -hmm. I think there should be, right? We have freedom of speech, but we don't have freedom of consequences, and I think we should get back to that. But it's it's a big leap forward. and It is. I mean, yeah, it's, I mean there's so many negative comments. You know, it's in, impossible to, to police that. Yeah. Well, because it feeds it. And then the algorithm on all platforms, if it starts with negativity, it doesn't view it as negativity. It views it as interaction. Engagement. Yeah. And interaction, yeah. Yeah, and they're like, pump it out, pump mm -hmm. it out. And people, like, you know, just recently the thing went up about, you know, the, the clip with uh, Preston. We're talking very minimally about, like, his expertise, Preston Stewart, who covers, like, conflicts overseas and everywhere. Mm -hmm. And, like, 
people were insulting us because in 45 seconds I didn't cover the global co- political conflict that is the Russia and Ukraine war in 45 seconds. I didn't have enough thoughts on it, which is wild to me because it's just a small excerpt of a larger thing. People mm-hmm. are like, these guys don't know what they're talking about. These are the two dumbest people. And I'm like, bro, that's a clip. What do you think is happening in 45 seconds? You think I'm going to be able to cover that? And they're like, oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, just people, I mean, they're 20 demanding. comments later, I'm sorry. They're selfish, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, internet's a great place. It's where I've, I've been able to flourish, where you've been able to flourish, yeah. but it also has a very, very dark side, which I know all of y'all, all of y'all know. But there I was, I, I created that show in current events and that was kind of much, that was pretty much it until I joined the Navy, graduated in 2010. And I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I never thought that, Hey, I can do this video stuff for a living because it was too good to be true. Yeah. And, and back then I was so used to, oh, you got to play it safe. You got to either go to college or get a good job. I, I was never taught that if you want something, you have to go all in for it and make it your priority. I was kind of in this zone where you kind of have to just play it safe and get a, you know, get a, develop a trade or get a degree. Mm-hmm. So that's why I kind of kicked into the back seat and kind of just after high school, I enrolled in college and two semesters later I dropped out. I said, this is not what I want to do. Yeah. And at the time my, my parents were going through a tough divorce Mm -hmm. and it made me independent and it made me realize like, Hey, there's, there's nothing for me here anymore. So I have to branch out. And that's when I, that's when I, I walked into the Navy recruiting office and I said, let's do this. Take me away. Take me away. And when we come back, we'll talk about that and everything that is Austin Alexander. Hope you guys are enjoying the episode. If you want to continue to hear more stories like this and to help us grow the podcast, please don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and to also drop a rating and review. Every bit helps. Thank you so much. Now let's get back to the episode. Welcome back. Anchors away. Here we are. With uh, one of my favorite sailors, I've got a lot of sailors in my life. Uh, you all will fight for my love. I think it's the only way to do it. You, Mike Sensi, and Donut. Um, Mike Sensi's a seaman, though. Yeah, he is a seaman. He's uh, he's you, the Mike. sword of the Lord. Real life Bible man, that guy. Um, is he really? Yeah, he's an RP. I didn't know that. Yeah, he's an RP. He he's- don't seem like an RP. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny. That's yeah, cool. no, he's... Um, Gotta have the RPs, though. Yeah, well, it's it's such a it's not antiquated, but it's such a very traditional role, mm-hmm. right? So an RP, a religious protector, is I believe so. Um, I'm not even sure. So, for anyone who doesn't know, a chaplain is considered a non-combatant. They're a multi-denominational officer, pa- pa- uh, multi- <laughs> pastor, but they're an officer, but they're multi-denominational religious mm-hmm. uh, person, and. Um, Non-combat means they literally can't carry weapons even. And so they have these guardians, these RPs that like literally like protect them against all things yeah. evil. RPs go ham. Yeah, they go ham. And if there's one that's going to go ham, it's Mike Sensi. I, um, a quick story about an RP. Go ahead. He was in, so we'll get into this a little later. But when I was in dive prep, there was an RP, you know, man of God, very, very well put together guy and when he went to dive school he i think he got got hammered on the beach and passed out and he got kicked out for like i don't know he just just wilding out like as an rp i thought it was the funniest thing yeah that's and, my that's, that's yeah, my rp story he, he fell short is what you're saying we all fall short of the glory of the yeah, lord praise jesus and he and he definitely did he took a dive down the bottle is that what you're saying he did yeah mm. poor guy it's definitely a sailor for sure yeah. Yeah. And you're going to tell us all about your time in the Navy. I'm fascinated with the Navy. I'm fascinated with the Navy because... What's your daddy branch? It is. Mm-hmm. It is. Um, the Navy... <clears throat> the Navy really got a lot of love in the American Revolution. And, you know, when we were using wood in the wind to move stuff. That's mm-hmm. when it got a lot of its attention. And now in the Navy SEAL era... Um, it gets a lot of attention too, but overall, I would say as a country in general, people really don't understand, this is my opinion, they really don't understand the purpose or the real role of protection and, um, not oversight, what's the, what's the, 
like guardianship that the Navy plays globally. Mm. I, I really don't think people understand that. <clears throat> Just because like in general, most people outside the military don't really understand what the military looks like on the inside. But like that just because they're not in Afghanistan doesn't mean that like the Navy, for example, isn't like patrolling the ocean, which yeah. there's so much more of that than land at all times, at all times and all the different areas of the world for various reasons to protect like, you know, our interests and to honestly maintain peace, mm-hmm. you know, because bottom line is if you get kidnapped, you, no matter what country you're from, you you hope the U S Navy shows up like pirates or whatever, or something goes wrong. You hope the U S Navy shows up. Mm-hmm. That's, that's literally what you hope. But at, at all times, there's a fleet out there patrolling the, the Atlantic and Pacific at all times. Yeah. They can be anywhere in the world in, you know, three to four days. For real? Yes. That's crazy. It is. That's crazy. And and that's just actually showing up and being physically present. Like, yeah. And the Navy has so many, like, shout out to the GMs and the fire controlmen out there, but they have, we have so many missiles and bombs that can make it anywhere in the world from those fleets within probably minutes. You know, I was an MA. I don't really know much about that tech, but... We got the we got the whole world covered. The Navy's got the whole world co- covered. Yeah, and it's that's that's why I, you know the Navy SEAL thing. It's not a knock against it. It's just like it's such a small, <clears throat> small, small part of the military at all, and even of of like the Navy in particular. Like people don't really understand what has to go into like doing these types of things on global scale. I mean, my introduction to it was in the Marine Corps. Longest ever I've gone without talking about being a Marine. New record um, is uh, when I was on the twenty fourth Mew. Mm-hmm. Right. And I was, uh, I did 30 days on the USS Nassau. I don't know what type of ship it was, but it was a nightmare. Right, LHD. It was a nightmare. Yeah. Absolute nightmare for me because I didn't have a job on a mm-hmm. ship. I was just a Marine and we're in the way. And like I was in a coffin rack that was, you know, we were four bunks high and I was a boot. So I was at the bottom. Wait. So at, on a Mew, you were with the Navy? So we so we were supposed to go to like the Mediterranean mm-hmm. and we were we were doing training, like literally just getting used to like running operations on a ship. Um, but we ended up going to Afghanistan. Like and they hadn't done that in yeah. a while. Mm-hmm. So but like during the workup, we were ju- we would just like practice conducting operations like off the ship, mm-hmm. um, you know, and like trying to basically learn how to stay out of the way of everyone who has a real job on the ship, like making sure it doesn't sink and i'm so dumb i'm like how does metal float like that's just my that's <laughs> crazy crazy I, concept yeah like i literally thought about it all the time like i'd be like how do we know it's floating like i would say stuff and be like shut up i'm like mm-hmm. no for real though think about it like it's all metal you ever seen metal float before and be like no and i'm like that's what i'm saying dude mm-hmm. you know i'm like charlie on the wall and like it's always sunny be like look look the answers are there yeah um but it was fun, but, like, uh, it, it just gave me a brief glimpse into, like, that. And then, like, the the index moment of the exercises, we got on, like, um, some landing craft. And we actually, like, landed on Onslow Beach in North Carolina and, like, did, like, a beach landing type thing. Mm-hmm. But, um, no, it was, it was a fun time. But my experience, so small, doesn't matter. <clears throat> I want to know what it's like to be a master at arms. So, yeah, when I originally went to the Navy recruiting office, of course, they hand you the Navy SEAL pamphlet. I was like, I want to do that. And they're like, okay, cool. They sent me to MEPS, check my eyesight. They said, your eyesight's not good enough. You can either be, if you still want to go to special operations, you can be EOD or you can be Navy diver. And I said, oh, well, well diving looks cool. Like my biggest fear is the water, so I, I can just conquer it by becoming a Navy diver. I signed up. Uh, my backup rate was information technician. I, I picked something that I didn't want to do at all. Yeah. And I started taking the physical screening test for special warfare slash special operations to get a contract to be Navy diver because you had to be pretty fit. And that was the first time that I was really exposed to like trying to become more for myself physically. Mm -hmm. And I would train twice a day. I would go to like a CrossFit class in the morning at CrossFit North Alabama. Shout out CrossFit Noella. Shout out. No free shout outs. And... I swam or did a long run in, in the evening and I had got some, some guys from my debt pool. You know, I, I set my ship date out seven months out so I could gain this contract. This mm-hmm. was in 2013. Mm-hmm. And I think I signed on in April or I depped in in April. If you don't know what DEP is, it's delayed entry program where you sign up and you don't go in for like six to 12 months Something later. Like that, yeah. yeah. And so took these PSTs, took a hundred trial PSTs and then I'm 
I showed up to take my first PST and that was my first engagement with a like a hard charging Navy. He was a master chief, master chief belt out of North Carolina. He flew all the way down to, to Huntsville, Alabama to proctor this physical screening test. Me and 12 dudes. I was so nervous before taking that test. The PST is a 500 meter swim. You got uh, push up, sit up, pull up, and then a mile and a half run. And, you know, you got Master Chief Belt there yelling at us and got in Coach Thomas that was a former SEAL that was helping us with our swim and everything. Took it. I was the only one out of 12 people that passed. My The swim cutoff was 1230. I swam at 1227. And long story short, I contracted to become a Navy diver and I shipped off to boot camp to an 800 division December 9th, 2013. Yeah. And I went through, through dive prep training and at training service center with their boot camp and then dive dive prep and i didn't pass the one of the final in water procedures which is where they strap you up twin 80s on your back weight belt fins and i grabbed the side of the pool they said nonverbal dor get out and they sent me to reclass and that's where i chose master at arms i looked at all the jobs that were available i picked the one with the shortest a school time because i just wanted to at that point i was like Screw this. I just want to get out. I'm trying to keep my language to a minimum here. You can say whatever you want. I just want to get out and <clears throat> and just get into the Navy so I can fulfill my duty and get out. Yeah. So I chose MA. And you were you were like rejecting the Navy at this point. Yeah. I was like, this is terrible. I made a terrible mistake. I'm not gonna be a Navy diver. Everything that I've trained for for, you know, nine, seven to nine months is has now been wiped away from me and taken away from me. And how much time did you have to make that decision from like the time you go uh, nonverbal DOR, which means for anyone who doesn't know, no. drop on request, drop on request, right? Which at the time I didn't know it's, it's not a thing. A nonverbal DOR is it's not, not a, a thing. thing, but the secret to military schools is honestly, they try to drop people or cut people yeah, for sure. It's cut through just, just to keep their attrition low. So it looks mm -hmm. cooler. I hate it. doesn't make any sense. It should just all be merit based and not like, Oh, well, so-and-so it's, I'm, it's, it's I'm not lame. blaming the Navy. I was not ready. No, for I'm, that training. I'm speaking on that. Like, it's always weird how they like, because they all like their graduation, their graduation rates to mm -hmm. be like only 20% of people made it. Like yeah. there's a lot of that stuff. It gets on my nerves, but, um, how much time did you have in between? Like, uh, what, <clears throat> what do you mean to like, you know, uh, Reclass what, and what were they choose. calling you? Uh, Sailor Alexander. What do they call you at that? Room? No, I was a seaman apprentice. SA. So, so I was like SA Alexander, Alexander, pick a pick a new rate, which is what the Navy calls your MOS. Yep. And they're like, pick a new rate, and you're like, what? I want to do this. Like, how much time has? Okay, so when I got dropped, it was a Thursday, and they sent me to Reclass Friday morning. So, so like all of the jobs from that week had already been picked and it was, it was basically needs of the Navy at that point. I walked into the reclass office, some guy, you know, civilian was on the phone, like typing away, talking to his wife or girlfriend or something like, Oh, what are you doing this weekend? Like, d don't even give a shit about me. I'm like, Hey, I'm here to choose like what I'm going to do in the Navy for the next four years. Dude just didn't care. And I'm sitting there for is like an boot hour. Camp or like where, where? No, this is at Training Service Center in Great Lakes. Okay, so that so is... we're out of the boot camp kind of mentality thing. Okay. I was still a new boot, you know, in fresh in dubs, mm -hmm. and and I'm I'm sitting there waiting. And an hour and a half later, he gets off the phone. He's like, "How can I help you?" I said, I'm, "I need a re-rate." And he just kind of laughed, and he's like, "Okay." He's like, "This is what we have: we have pack seamen, pack airmen, and we have corpsmen." And I didn't even know what a corpsman was. I was like, what is a corpsman? He's like, read the definition. And he's like, uh, you know, you provide medical and care to different units, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, I, I had no interest in the medical field. So it was between pack seaman, pack airman, and corpsman. I'm like sitting there. I'm like, man, I'm like thinking I've had to do one of these jobs that I don't want to do for the next four years. And he's like, you know, I tell you what, since I was on the phone and you came in here, I was kind of rude. Then you come back early as possible Monday morning and you'll have a fresh list of jobs he really said like, that thank god yeah That's thank awesome. god well his it's his fault it is so his. he should have done that no for sure but still good on you for not being like <laughs> <laughs> just like flipping everything yeah i'm i'm i can control my i'm i don't i never act out of violence or i can i'm very control over my motion so i was like, okay thank you sir so i come back monday morning i had a fresh list of jobs air crew air sport was on there you had 
probably RP on there a few times, parachute rigger, and then I saw Master at Arms, which is is naval security. I said, oh, my grandpa was an MP. Yeah. My uncle's in the Coast Guard as in uh, maritime enforcement. Yeah. And I said, I'll do I'll do Master at Arms. I could carry a weapon. I could, yeah. you know, I could arrest people. Yeah. So I chose it. I was on hold for like six, seven or eight weeks in Great Lakes, which was great. I texted muster like every morning, every day at 12, I'd be like, Hey, I'm alive. Okay, cool. That was my only duty. We would go out to Chicago and just kind of party and everything. That was back when I drank. So I would just drink and just have a good time, change out into my civilian clothes from, from, uh, the NSUs and just go have a good time in Chicago. That's actually kind of cool. There's little secrets people don't know is that sometimes in these school pipelines, there's mm-hmm. gaps of just weird schedules like boot camp to your um, job school, advanced infantry training, whatever it's called. There's these moments where they're like, hey, it doesn't start for like a month or mm-hmm. three months and you just kind of hang out. Like, yeah. and you have to get to do stuff like that. And if you're not a, a boot or like you're out of boot camp, it's the best. It is. It was fun yeah because they're just like it's okay because you're literally just you're you're not i was stealing's the only word i can think of right now but you're just kind of getting away with it but there's nothing they can do with you and as long as you don't cause problems you don't have no problems exactly yeah stay out of the limelight and then and you're good um i think it was uh i heard that's the first time i heard the phrase don't spotlight yourself was in the military and i Mm -hmm. think of that like don't spotlight yourself don't get caught doing bad don't get caught doing good because then people like hey who's who's that who's that yahoo over there yep you don't, don't want that. Don't bring attention to yourself. Well, that's crazy, though, that, like, you're there, <laughs> and then they're, like, days later, like, you have to change all of this. Yeah, and, and all of a sudden, I get contacted. I get pulled into the office. Hey, you guys are flying to Texas on Wednesday, and it was, like, Tuesday. It was me, Thatcher, and a guy named, I forgot his, his name, but us three came from the dive program. Yeah. We flew to Texas uh, to Lackland Air Force Base. It was a joint, it was, you know, it was a, yeah, yeah. a joint base. Navy had a very small corner in the back and they put us up in the the barracks. We checked in and they're like, leave all your civilian clothes here. This is your phase zero. You cannot leave the base. Like it was locked down. (sighs) Going from this, having all this liberty, go do whatever I want, back into phase zero liberty. You couldn't even wear regular gym clothes to the gym. You had to wear, you know, your, that ugly Navy PT uniform, which I hated. Which one was that one? The it's brown a one? bright gold, and it looks like kind of brown. It's like a, it's like a bright brown and gold shirt with a reflective navy on it, and the and the navy colored shorts. Can you bring that up, Aaron? Um, T- terrible, terrible colors. It's just like <clears throat> navy PT uniform is what it would say. Um, I remember uh, we. Uh, I think it's the one I'm thinking of. Is is that it right there? That's it right there. So when we were on the Nassau. Uh, our doc was there. The guy running. Yeah. That's it. So our doc, we would borrow his uh, his PT gear because Marines could only be in the gym for like two hours. Mm-hmm. But <clears throat> if you had Navy PT gear, you could be in there forever. So like eight, dudes, Navy would, eight dudes would like wear one shirt just to get in there. I kind of like it though, dude. What? Why? I mean, it's very distinguishable. That's the thing I like about it. Distinguishable? Yeah, I don't know. I think because like the uniform we had was green on green with sweats, mm-hmm. and then they changed to the new Marine Corps uniform, and which is just absolute trash. But the thing I hated about it because the shorts were so they're like, long. I hated that. That that's what I don't like about it though. Uh, but all the military PT uniforms, like I don't know, I don't know who who sized them or like what the goal is. I guess it's to look ridiculous at all times, but like. I remember they would never touch my legs, the mm. big shorts they had. Like, it would, but we would always like wear silkies when we got to the unit, and then that was just a game of dudes being silly dudes. Yeah, um, See, I wish we could do that, but no, nah, they, they had us in those long ass navy shorts. Yeah, they're not flattering to <clears throat> say the least. Nope, not at all. They're designed to not be flattering. Uh, maybe I, I don't know. Like it's some navy's such a strong word. Like when I see it though. It's so strong. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's good branding, yeah. It's so good. Um, did you know anything about Navy divers prior to that? No, nothing. You didn't watch uh, what's the Men of Honor? You hadn't seen that nope. movie or anything like that? No. Nope. Have you I, seen it since? Yep. I watched it several times. Great, great movie. Incredible movie, we right? Used, so, so we, when we were dropped, you know, you had a bunch of depressed guys in this group and we would all just like watch movies and whatnot at like, let's say for some instance, if we did have to stay for a physical muster, 
we had this room. It was like a studio. We would all, it was a lounge area. We'd go watch movies and everything. Yeah. And that's where we watched it after I was dropped from dive. Dude, yeah. it's, and it's such a good movie. It's a great movie. It's one of, it's one of the best military movies. Like the scene at the end where he's like, I want my 10. I'm mm -hmm. just like bawling. I'm like, all right, that's so cool. And yep. Eddie's such a, just the, brotherhood that develops out of you know pure adversity that becomes something so much more i mean that's what the military is at its core is people from all over the the, the world america um uh, people from all over the greatest country of all time damn straight um come together and like you'd never meet them otherwise but mm -hmm. like you go through this real time experience of trauma bonding and like something incredible comes out the other side you know mm -hmm. and it's, it's truly um something to behold for sure. But what was it like going back to phase zero, being a master at arms? and It was terrible. It was like really depressing. Like They were like, hey, just you guys are on hold. Be prepared to, to show up 06 to PT, and then you're going to shine brass after that. Really? Yes. That's pure Navy stuff. We just shine brass from, from the water, from the spouts that came out from the gutter. There was a spout, and we would just shine it all day. Why? Like the same one. Just busy work. Getting there out the no, brass, though, huh? Yeah. And <laughs> we, we just, I mean, it was terrible, but it was great at the same time. Cause you were the same people every single day. Like schedule was very predictable. Yeah. We had a, a squirrel there. We called him Admiral Acorn. He was this real fat squirrel. Every time we saw him, we'd salute him. And it was just, you know, oh, a real squirrel, stupid, <laughs> an actual squirrel, yeah. <laughs> just the stupidest things that we just found so much joy in. And when, when you're at a low point, you find joy in the smallest of things like saluting a freaking squirrel. Yeah. I know. I, I couldn't agree more. Those are <coughs> core memory moments. Just mm -hmm. you doing Brasso. Yeah. Yep. Good to see you, Admiral Squirrel. Yep. Morning, Admiral Squirrel. <laughs> That's awesome. We'd all stand at attention and I'd, you know, call all hands that when Admiral Squirrel. Catch you on deck. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Dude, that's sick. Yep. Good times. I love it. Um, how long is MA school? MA school is seven weeks. I, I classed up. I was the class leader. Because coming from dive, hell yeah, you know, I was very physically in shape. I would run. I was um, I was a run lead, PT lead, and that's where I got the first experience of of actually leading people who who looked up to me. You yeah. know, in dive, I was kind of like a regular guy. I was amongst all these alpha males. Yeah. And in MIA school, I was the guy. You know, I was six foot three, hundred and ninety, two hundred pounds. Like a lot of people looked up to me. And I would have killed for you as a corpsman in a line platoon. Mm -hmm. I would have literally sold all my corpsmen for you to be like, my name's Austin. I'm <laughs> going to be your doc. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. <laughs> yeah, it was a, it was a good time. Seven weeks. We, we did all types, learned all types of weaponry, M203, M4, M500 shotgun, M, M9 Beretta, all types of rounds. We learned, you know, max effective ranges like master at arms. That's really what it is. You are, you are trained in the arms that the Navy provides you. You're supposed to be, stop me, please, the weapons expert on the ship, right? Isn't that the idea initially? Like, if you go back to, like, originally when it was just, like, mm -hmm. dudes on a wooden boat, you were the guy that knew all the weapons systems. Exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah. So you'd be like, oh, it's the cannon muskets, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's MA is a, it's a very, it was, it's a kind of a new rate. Before, they called it shore patrol, and I think they would just kind of manage all the weaponry. Like, they would, they would be in charge of the weaponry. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And... So that's what we did. We trained in weapons, and then they added a side of naval security, like anti-terrorism task force and uh, and shore patrol aspects. Like, okay, if a man's intoxicated, how do you talk to them? I learned how to speak. I learned uh, handcuffing, mechanical advantage control holds, yeah. things that are very police officer oriented. Yeah. And graduated MAA school in 2014. Mm. In October, I went home for a week to see the girlfriend the girl I was dating at the time, Stephanie okay. McClure. Okay. And shout out Steph. Shout out Stephanie. Hope hopefully you're doing well. Yeah. And I went to Bahrain. Went to Bahrain. Went to Bahrain. Yeah. Step step off the plane in Bahrain. It was like a hair dryer. I was like, what am I doing? It was 130 degrees. Lord have mercy. Hot. I went with two friends from from A school, Justine Rivera and Crystal Holsizer, great friends of mine still mm -hmm. to this day. And stepped off, immediately started, you know, checked into the command at um, Naval Security, Naval Support Activity Bahrain. Okay. It's the most forward deployed base or the most forward base that we have over there in the in the Middle Eastern AOR. Yes. And we had the Fast Company Marines over there, great yeah. guys. Yeah. 
bunch of studs over there. And those dudes are hard chargers. Oh yeah, they are. When they hit the fleet, they come in like dogs that have been Mm -hmm. like on a leash too long. They're like, exactly. Yeah. All they do is PT and patrols and security the whole time. They're there. PT patrol security, Mm -hmm. PT patrol. So like they all show up like corporals and like they're jacked. They're like, I do 45 bull ups. They were, they were monsters. They're they're gnarly. Yeah. I had become friends with a bunch of them. Yeah, it's just dudes being dudes twenty four seven. Yep. Like, and they're just like, uh, uh, it's 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 wild. Look at this. I'm getting chills just thinking about those times. Yeah. yeah. I met a lot of great people in Bahrain. We had. How we long had, were you there? I was there for two years. Really? Mm-hmm. The whole. That's how it works. Two years. It's not a deployment technically for the Navy. Uh, for the fast company Marines, I believe it was. It is but, a deployment for them. Yeah. It's for us. It's not. It's it's a station. So I was stationed there for two years, it's 24 like a temporary, months. Like, interesting. Yeah, it's a, it's a duty station. And, and working, I, I worked the gates. So that's where I kind of came out of my shell. I remember I was telling you, as an introvert, Yeah. I was talking to people, good morning, sir. May yeah. I see your ID, please? Check, checking to make sure, make sure all the points of the base were accessible to us, but inaccessible to people from the outside. Yeah. And just seeing the culture in Bahrain and the Arabic and the Muslim culture, it was just such a culture shock to me. I'd never seen anything like it before. Mm-hmm. Seeing people dress differently and people speaking differently, it was uh, it opened my eyes to a lot of things. Like, when you see that for the first time, was it just... For me, especially... Have, what was your initial feeling? Well, after 9-11, you know, the, the entire Muslim kind of it it wasn't a, a good impression like i was i automatically assumed the worst in every arabic person and every muslim person just being honest yeah you know because of the the environment in, in america at that time mm-hmm. and and hearing the the muslim prayer every single morning called a prayer yeah yeah and it was it was different and i was just adjusting to it and and trying to be willing to accept that hey not every muslim is a bad person and not every person that's different is a bad person that's dude i one of the best things from the military is your exposure to different cultures mm-hmm. in different places i mean the the there i'm sure there's better ways to get it maybe i don't know but like it's one of the best gifts i ever got being able to see different cultures mm-hmm. and different countries in particular the way other people live like it's some things I admire about them. Like I always say, like if, if somebody blinks, I'll be back to Afghanistan in a heartbeat or like someone living tribally with my family every day, working mm-hmm. outside, enjoying that family, like understanding that stuff. There's something to really be admired about, you know, those values that I, I long for. I mean, we still have them, but you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. a slower, more um, intentional way of living. Mm-hmm. Cause otherwise if, if you're not these comforts we have can quickly like dull you to like missing out on all the things that are right in front of you. I feel. Yeah, I completely agree. It opened my eyes to a lot of things. It, it, it brought an acceptance for me, you know, and I've met people from Kenya, from Bangladesh, India, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, and just overall good people. I still talk to a good friend of mine over there. He lives in Pakistan. His name's Asif Kayani. Mm-hmm. I bought my first car in Bahrain from him. It was a 2008 Chevy Optra, which is not a it's thing not, over here in the yeah, U.S. Yeah, there's, that's the thing, too. People don't know that. There's a ton of cars that, like, just aren't in America that mm-hmm. are overseas. Yeah. And great, greatest guy, like, one of the greatest people, like, just so nice. I remember when I first met him, I always expected to for him to ask something of me, but he never asked anything of me at all. Mm. And, you know, coming from the culture in America, like, people kind of latch on, like, hey, can, can, I, can you do this? Can you do this? Can I have this? Seeing him like as just a humble person, especially as a Pakistani man, mm-hmm. it was like it opened my eyes. Like, still a great friend of mine. I chat with him all the time. We do have, we we can't be too transactional as a as a culture. Yeah, the hustle mentality of America has mm-hmm. its downfalls. Mm-hmm. I'll hundred percent ship that and co-sign that for you as well. Yeah, and, like, and and I do it too. Sometimes I find myself reaching out to someone I haven't spoken to in six months and asking for something. Yeah, you know I'm. It's hard. I mean, I, I, I definitely do it too. I'm sure. I'm sure I've done it, and I'll do it again. I. That's why I have my wife to like rein me in. Mm. No, I, I get it. So you're there for two years. I'm there for two years. Well, I went. I went uh, about six months in. I, I was. I was working the gate, and then I switched over to Harbor Patrol, and my life changed. I loved, loved it. it. I loved it. I loved every every minute of it. You're like out there on the boat. Pull over. 
No, it was more that's like... That's a handicap spot, you know? It was, <laughs> it was less... Yeah. That's how it was in the States, for yeah. sure. It was less <laughs> law enforcement, more maritime enforcement, like... Hey, there's a man on this jet ski. Let's bring out the FLIR and see what he's doing or if he's carrying anything. Hey, let's look Whoa. at these dowels. Let's, you know, let's pull over this dowel with the Coast Guard cutter and see what it's about, yeah. you know, see what's going on. I like this. We, we are basically just a call unit. Like, hey, something's weird. Call in the Scruffy, 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 eight, uh, you know, Harvest Crew Boat 807. We have a man on a dowel who looks like he's throwing up. Like, we, we managed everything in that harbor. And our goal was to protect the big Coast Guard cutters and the Mikes and the UK ships and the French ships from anything on the waterfront. And that included inspections, going in with the M4s, checking the, yeah. the Bahraini fuel. You have to check the fuel? Well, they had these big ships that would pull in and fuel the ships. Okay. And we had the job of going in, dropping the NWDs, dropping the divers, going in, the MAs with the M4s, you know, pretending like we're this expeditionary unit, going in, telling telling the, the Bahraini locals, hey, stand aside. You know, sometimes we'd maybe have to handcuff them if they're doing something weird or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'd inspect that entire vessel to make yep. sure there's no explosives. Yeah. Big, big job because you, you make one mistake, that entire Port. base, yeah. that entire base is gone. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it matured me a lot. And having to bring in these HVAs, these high-valued assets, carriers with 6,000 sailors on them, we would lead them along with Coastal River on Squadron. And it was, I loved it. I loved the intensity of it, standing out there on that 240, just acting like I'm the shit, like with an American flag in the background with a big-ass machine gun on, Hell the, yeah. on the ocean. I loved it. Do you have a photo of that? Yeah, I have several of them. Dude, guys will see that yeah. and think, Hell, Hell yeah. 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 Dude. <laughs> I mean, yep. what a scene. I yep. Just this big blonde boy from Alabama. Hair in flowing in slow-mo. Yeah, and you're on a 240. Hey, hey, Scruffy's inbound. Yep. Like, you're just, dude, is that your call sign? What was your call sign? Uh, we, I had different call signs depending on what, what Harvest Security Boat. So I was, I was, you know, Harvest Security Boat uh, 1007, 1001, 801, 807, yeah, whatever yeah. the number was. Yeah. yeah. I would have given you a nickname off the bat. I would It would have been Alabama Slamma. Like Alabama slam. We didn't. We didn't use specific call signs. I know, but I still would have been like, "Hey, hey, call it, call on the slammer." You alpha, know? alpha yeah. Sierra, yeah. Alabama call slammer. Alpha Sierra, dude. Yeah. <laughs> call it, call it double A, double Alpha. Yep. Good times out there. You're making me think about it. Bahrain was a, was a great time. It sucked, but it was a great time. It sucks, but like when you're in the military, you train for so long to be able to do your trade, to be able to do your craft. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's the best part. It's also the hardest part because it's stressful. You're away from everyone. It's very isolating, but you're also doing it with people. It's it's such a thing, man. Mm -hmm. It's I mean, it's it's wild. I I I miss it constantly. Um, but you know. I miss being with, with my friends every day. That's really what it comes down to. You're with your friends every single day in every single way. And it's awesome. Yep. So how after Bahrain, what's what's next for you then? After Bahrain, I had I had experienced a lot. Yeah. A lot. I had two two of good friends of mine. You know, in Bahrain the suicide rate was pretty high. Two two friends of mine, two of them back um, stateside had taken their life. And so I was exposed to lots of, you know, just kind of adapt, trying to adapt through it. And, and, you know, we had a guy, people jumping from buildings, people one night on the Coast Guard cutters, one guy just shot himself, like a, a Coastie just, you know, took his own life. And like, really? yeah, we were exposed to that constantly over in Bahrain. And when I had left, I had matured like so much. I had you know, been dealing with a lot of that th stuff, just thinking about my friends that were gone and, and it, Bahrain matured me for sure. And I, I showed up to, to VFA two strike fighter squadron two out of Lemoore, California as an MA. And I showed up and I was meeting all these aviation people and they had never met an MA before. And yeah. I had never met aviation people before. Yeah. And I had all these ribbons stacked like, you know, um, Overseas service. I had two NAMs at the time. I had national defense, the GWAT. Yeah, GWAT. Yeah, dude, bro, you're stacked. And then up. there's a, a sea duty mm -hmm. uh, ribbon as well. And I'm showing up, and these aviation people, they don't have any. They have like the national defense and maybe something else, like yeah. a sharpshooter, yeah. something like that. And you had two or three rows. Yeah. Yeah. Three rows. Three yeah. rows. Yeah. A double E's sharpshooter. I mean, a double E's um, on M4 and M9 which is something the aviation people hadn't seen, I guess. And 
they were all like, dang, dude, like, what is this? What is this? Asking about my ribbons. And I was like, don't ask me about it. Just yeah. call me, you know, boots on ground. I was boots on ground. It was a joke. Obviously, yeah, I wasn't boots yeah. on ground in combat, but they called me BOG. And it was great. <laughs> and, uh, you know, every, every morning, what's up, BOG? What's going on? Like, I showed up with this presence, like a, a very bold presence. Yeah. And I, I fit right into VFA, too. And from there, that's when I de- deployed on the Carl Vinson. Went on a, a Western Pacific cruise in 2017. How was that? It was... I had... Coming from Bahrain, I did a very good job at adapting. You know, if something was thrown at me, okay, cool, going on deployment, cool, let's do this thing. I was just kind of just nonchalant about it. But when I actually got there and sunk in and saw the sailors, you know, a lot of them were depressed, a lot of them were happy. But just seeing the the, the culture and the vibe there, it was kind of like a love-hate, just like Bahrain. You know, I, I love the food. We ate, I ate four times a day. I worked out all the time. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my fitness was there. It was there. You had to fight for a spot in the gym because you had 5,500 sailors yeah. in three gyms. Mm-hmm. Uh, but the food was good. I I liked deploying. I would never want to do it again. Yeah. But I liked it. Yeah. We got to see different ports: Guam, South Korea, Hawaii, Singapore. I was constantly, you know, exposed to these different things again, just like Bahrain. Bahrain was like a dipping my toe in. Deployment was a whole, the whole meat and potatoes. It sounds so incredible. I mean, like, I remember when they were talking to us about the Mew and everything, we'd go in the Mediterranean, but I remember hearing about Marines in the 80s and stuff doing West Packs in particular. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's what, like, a part of me wants to go to that, go to that part of the world so bad. Like, just to see, I feel like it's, it might be my last great adventure is to, like, do some type of thing, just like traveling that very similar route just Mm -hmm. because I I want to see that part of the world, you know? Yeah. I want to see where it's like the edge of the unknown, if that makes sense. We can go. Fine. We'll do it. Good. Yeah. Done. Monetize (laughs) it. We'll get a Travelocity to sponsor it or something. Yeah. Makes him turn this whole thing into a real business. Um, That deployment that you talk about, the love, hate, um, did that carry on after when you got back? The love hate was it was it with the military or just just like how gone you were or different things? It was everything was changing so fast. You yeah. know, I, I came from this small town in Florence, Alabama, to going in to be you know this big title, a diver, and then being switched from that to a master at arms, and then going to Bahrain for two years, meeting all types of people from all walks walks of life, and then being deployed on an aircraft carrier. Like that was all within three years. That's gnarly. And I was just being slung left and right. I was getting qualifications. I was getting, you know, doing these gun shoots in the middle of the desert, driving Humvees, like all this. It was crazy to me. And in Bahrain, about halfway through, I had accumulated like a lot of debt. Yeah. That was something the Navy didn't teach me is is financial. Literacy. Exactly. Yep. And especially being from small town Alabama, I didn't learn it back then. No. So that was something that I was dealing with as well. And when I went on deployment, that's when I started to think, man, I'm doing a lot of incredible things. I want to show my friends. So I had created a documentary. I, I purchased a, a camera in Bahrain. Didn't really use it a whole lot. I think I took out like $300 on a cash advance. I'd purchased this Canon T5i. Mm-hmm. which is what everybody starts out on, seems like. And on deployment, I created this documentary called Day in the Life of a Navy Sailor. Okay. It took me seven months to make the entire documentary. I relearned editing software, Adobe Premiere Pro. I was in the the mass media communications office all the time, like asking them, what is this? What is this? What does this tool do? Like all the editing stuff. I got footage from them and I created a seven minute documentary. It took me seven months to make it. And... Is that video still live? The video's still live. It's on your channel? <laughs> on YouTube. On yep. Austin Alexander? Austin Alexander channel. Still there. Yeah. W- would never take it down. You should never take it down. I, I'm, I'm, I'm so against the, like, this is me early stuff. Mm-hmm. Like, you, you know, because it is crawl, walk, run, whatever it is you do. Let's check, look at that Oldest, guy. yep. Day in the life of a Navy sailor. Bro, That's it right there. look at that guy. Yeah, six Dude, years you look ago. look like a mop. It's upsetting. I look like a what? Just a, you just, I swear, if I was, if I was at Navy and I saw you, I'd be like, invest. We need to invest. Invest. I mean, yeah. look at you, blonde haired, big, gorgeous. Look at that. 
Look at you. Looking off into the deep, the unknown. Yep. And getting I, ready to go punch Aquaman if he comes up. Just imagine staring out into the abyss like that for seven months. No land. I honestly can't imagine it. I had very few moments. Again, I was only on the ship for 30 days. Mm -hmm. But I do remember feeling incredibly small walking out to like with the flight deck mm -hmm. and just not even the flight deck. There was like little places where you could like out by the smoke pit or whatever. But like you could look out and like you would just be like, oh, there's what is the fading point of the horizon lines? What, 15 miles? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. And like, oh, there's nothing. There's literally nothing. We're not even that far out in the ocean. I think we just went like we said a 30 day loop. So we couldn't have gone that far. But you're literally off into forever. Yeah, it was it was crazy. If you scan through, you'll see me like going through like eating things and like meatballs. Look I made that. a joke about that's the water because it was brown. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. really brown. Yeah. Look at you, dude. Just just kind of showing my family. I didn't make this for anybody but my family. And I posted it on Facebook and people said, you should post this on YouTube. And so I did. And Six years ago. I posted it in 2017 and didn't really look back at my channel. Such a babe. Look at you getting ready to punch that's an octopus. That's South Korea at the fish market. Yep. Uh, that's Guam at Lover's Peak. A lot of people jump off that, by the way, but we'll say that for a different story. Crabs. So, yeah, just me exploring the world and kind of just I, I made the video for my family and myself for me to kind of just re- Ooh. Think and recollect right -click, everything. Right click, save that photo. Jumping off a ship, what's this that is like? A very, so not a lot of sailors get to do that. It's a very rare thing. When you jump, that was off the coast of Hawaii. Yeah. When you jump down, you go probably 10, 12 feet under and you look at the hull of the ship. Yeah. You can see everything because the visibility is like 100 or 200 feet. Those waters are so clear. Yeah. Good friend of mine, Ron Ivy. So what is it? What is it called? I know there's the turtles. Where do you? The shellback. Shell. So what, shellback. Tell, walk me through some of that okay. real quick. So when I'm you probably gonna clip it. I want you to tell me all the different Navy traditions real quick. Yeah. So there are different types of shellback. There's emerald shellback. There's there's the Neptunus Regis, which I believe that's when you cross the equator. Mm -hmm. That's what we did. We actually made a special trip, a detour for like one or two days so we could cross the equator real quick. We could become a shellback. Yeah. You go through this ceremony where you get roasted. I'm not, it's a, it's a Navy tradition. I'm not going to talk about what happens to you during the ceremony, but at the end of it, you have to appear before, I can't remember his name, but you have to appear before this council. Basically. Yeah. Like it's like a committee, right? And you're like, you know, please allow me in, like, please accept me. Yeah. Sometimes they would send people back and say, no, do it over again. But I showed up, they blessed me. They, I became a shell back and I was a, at that point I was a, a true sailor. Cause you crossed the equator. Well, not only that, you crossed the equator and you passed the entire seven hour roasting ceremony Yeah. where you're having to eat mustard out of people's belly buttons and things like that. And really, that's funny. Uh, Aaron, if you can go ahead and bring the mustard out, we're going to reenact that real quick. Out of your belly button? Yeah. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, but that's where all the tattoos come from, right? Do you have yep. a turtle? I don't have a turtle. Dude, you got to get one. I don't have any Navy-inspired tattoos. Yet. Yeah, I'm going to get one. I'm going to get a few. I, I desperately want to put hold fast on my knuckles. Because I I saw it, and it's supposed to be for good luck, right? Yeah. And I think I read about it in Harry Bosch, because... Uh, the Harry Bosch books, it's it, this kid, it's about a uh, a war veteran. He's a Vietnam veteran. He's mm -hmm. in the Army, but he had these tattoos and said, hold fast, because he was, like, fascinated and wanted to be the Navy. But this guy made him, like, punch the wall and tear him off. But I heard me mm -hmm. like, oh, yeah, I want to do that. You'll know when it happens, because I'll, I'll have, like, sold out big time to, like, big cardboard or whatever. Yeah. And then I'll have enough money. <laughs> big right cardboard. I'll, well, I'll have enough money to not worry about anything. Like, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll feel secure, as opposed to, like, having to wear Band-Aids over my knuckles yeah. when I have to get a real job. But... Um, I've always loved the Marine Corps and the Navy. We are, you know, brother branches, whatever it's called. But, like, the tradition of the Navy, because it goes back. So the Navy, when it was first established, was to protect commerce and security globally. And their job was just to run the ship. And the Marine Corps was like, well, we need dum-dums to send out there, mm -hmm. right? And so that's where a lot of the... The shared uh, history comes from with the tattoos and stuff because it's always so cool seeing those dudes with, like the Sailor Jerry stuff getting. Yep. What is it there? Is it what are the birds? Um, so you got the the pig and rooster. Yeah. And 
on old time Navy ships, the pig and rooster, they would keep them in these floatable boxes. That way if the, if the, if the ship sank and the sailors were like holding on to, you know, boards and wood to float, they would also have the pig and rooster there to produce food for them. So a lot of sailors get them tattooed on their feet or their hands, primarily feet, because if they're ever in the water, then they won't drown. That's the whole, the whole premise behind it. There's that. Yeah. So pig and rooster. What's the other one with the, is it doves? Or like if you do something, there's doves and then the I'm shell not, back, something. I'm not there's sure. A, I just love the history of it, mm -hmm. right? Because I also love that the Navy, in my opinion, is the branch that was like the wildest. Because when you think about it, it's just dudes being like, what happened? So I was like on a boat. The wind pushed us that way. Mm -hmm. It felt like forever. And then we saw a place and then they draw the place. And they're like, that's what it looks like there. And then they use the wind to come back. Yeah. That's gnarly when you think about it. Old school compass, like just, yeah. Yeah, just like, you know, it making it up as you go. Like, look, that's, maybe it's what I, I was just born too late to explore the West, born too early to explore Mars. That's what I really want. I want to explore. But you'd already begun to explore your creative side more than ever, and you found something in life of a sailor. Mm -hmm. And I created a video and put it out, and, and I didn't look at my channel for like a, you know, eight months to a year after that. I didn't. Didn't think twice about it. No, no. I was at, at that time. I had come off a of deployment. I had been taken to Naval Weapons Station, Seal Beach, and Harbor Patrol. Mm -hmm. And I was in all this debt. And I was like, man, this sucks. I had met an incredible young woman, Sarah. Yeah. And, and she made me want to be better. And I said, she didn't know I was in all this debt. The first thing I said, I said, I need to get out of this debt. I need to become financially responsible. I need to educate myself behind this. And then that's when you started making a plan to find some financial freedom. I started teaching and I, I made a plan. And that's when my life changed at 25 years old. And when we come back, we'll get right into that. Yes, we will. We still have 26 seconds. We, <laughs> should, we should talk about the strip clubs that I went to on deployment. <laughs> so there are a bunch of good ones. There's a good uh, one in Guam. And now nah, I'm just kidding. Don't put this in there. But yeah. <laughs> no, but well, before 25, I was pretty wild. All right. I'm, a, I'm very settled down. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a very mature. Very mature and very now. single. We'll be right back with a very mature and very single, very successful Austin Alexander. If you DM me, I might hook you up with him. Thank Join you. Join us. Yes. And we're back. If you haven't DM'd me already for Austin's information, you are missing out. And again, if you say you don't know who he is, you are actually lying. This is the amazing, the great, the incredible. Someone is very dear to me, actually. Thank He's you helped very much. me in ways that most people don't know. He helped redesign my website, helped me with business ideas. He's literally a part of my life. I love him. Austin Alexander, which you can find him anywhere online, a.k.a. Mr. Pull-Ups, Mr. Battle Bus, Mr. Bunker. Let's get into it. I'm excited for this part. I'm too. This is the deep stuff. This is the deep stuff really because deep stuff. we're really going to, you know, everyone sees what you put out as a creator, but, you know, as in life, Nobody really knows what's going on, mm -hmm. right? But they also don't really understand the work. But this is where I, I really am excited for you because we talked a little bit about, like, you know, nobody really understands what it takes to to get to – they're like, oh, you, they think you just show up and you just, like, do pull-ups or whatever or, like, the trade craft, the you know, the, the time and effort and energy it takes to actually put out a product consistently and then – you know, no one ever tells you when you have a dream and you get your dream how hard it is to keep living it. You know what I'm saying? But it is. It's a it's a battle every single day. Yeah, but you're doing it, right? But before we get to that part, we're uploading. Oh, was it a life yeah. in the day of the sailors? Is that what it was? Yep. Yes, sir. And and at the time, you know, I was at Naval Weapons Station, Seal Beach. Had met a very well put together young woman named yeah. Sarah. Yeah. And I was in a lot of debt. And when I was 25, I remember I I started diving into ways to make money online. Yeah. I studied it all. I took a, a marketing course, social media marketing course. Like I mentioned earlier that I was a, a dropout, you know, so up until this time, I really didn't believe in myself. And I guess society gave me the impression like, hey, if you don't have a college degree, you really not, you're not going to amount to anything. Mm -hmm. And so that's when I started studying. I started learning about everything online, Amazon, FBA, e-commerce, stock option trading, drop shipping, just converting landing pages, social media, video creation, everything. And, and I, I tried a few, a few things. Like I would trade some stock, stock, stock yeah. options here and there. I tried some e-com. I uh, started a business called Architure, which was uh, kind of had like sleeves and support, like ankle wrist support, simple things that I could sell on Amazon. I started a watch company called The Business Gentleman. Like these are the things that I've never even spoken about because 
their it was kind of like the start. I really didn't do anything with them. I was kind of like learning. And I started a coffee company called the Captain's Cup Coffee. Was, and all these kind of, all these things were trial. Yeah. And, I, and they would have succeeded if I put the time and energy into them. But I just kind of was just teaching myself about Shopify, you know, drop shipping, things like that. You're on, you're getting on the job training. OJT. Yeah. OJT, and, yeah. And I knew that to learn it, I had to do it. And I did. And still in, you know, $20,000 in credit card debt every single day, that was weighing on me. Well, but at least you're getting out there and doing it, not to minimize that. Like, that's what I like about you is that you'll, you'll swing mm -hmm. and I feed off that energy because I'm, I swing too much probably, but I like someone who gets out there like, ah, I don't know what I'm doing. I'll figure it out. Exactly. Not a negative way, but like you, you put effort into it. Mm -hmm. Like you're studying, you're doing research, you're watching videos. Like mm -hmm. you're, you're going to figure this thing out as you go. Right. As opposed yeah. to like, Oh, I'm scared. I hate that. I, Historically, I wasn't good at executing. Yeah. Like until I was about 25 and I started reading all these books and, and I said, you know, I've, it's time for me to, to jump, to take the leap and start executing. And that's when I did. And I got into all this, all this stuff. And then YouTube was kind of on the back burner. I never believed like, Hey, there's, I'm not going to become a YouTuber. I'm not good enough. I'm not good enough. Nobody wants to watch what I'm, I'm posting. Meanwhile, there's a video that I created the, the documentary Day in Life of Navy Sailor mm -hmm. that was getting, you know, it was like 500, 600, 700 views. And when I logged back into my YouTube account, I saw that. And Sarah specifically at the time was like, this is a great video. You need to make more of these. And to me, I was like, nah, you know, I'm not good enough for YouTube. And then finally, I was on night shift working the Harbor Patrol. I was my off day. I think I was playing a game or something on my computer and Sarah walked out and she said, dude, what are you doing? you need to go in there and be productive. You should film a YouTube video. I'm like, Sarah, I don't know what, what I'm going to do. She's like, I don't care. Go in there and film a YouTube video. And that's when I went in there, I filmed a YouTube video. I used Adobe Premiere, my pirated copy from the media division on the ship. Yeah. And I edited it and I posted it. And What was that video? It was best job in the Navy. Best job in the Navy. Yeah. And, or what is the best job in the Navy? It was the only thing that I could think of to come to mind. I was just sitting down, sit, sitting down and talking. I filmed it on my iPad because I didn't even feel like getting my camera out. I was like, this is going to go nowhere. I posted it. I started getting comments from sailors like, hey, man, I agree with this video. Like, great video. Keep posting, please. Love your documentary. And I fed off of that. I was like, oh, this is cool. Okay, let me make another video. Best job um, or which branch to join. And... I started slowly getting into YouTube and, and reading all these comments and it fueled me because I related to these people and they related to me. Well, did you have any intentional thought of like the SEO of like best job in the military? No. You, it just came to you? It just, I didn't even know how to run the YouTube studio. I would just basically upload it without a thumbnail and then yeah. title it, no description, and I would just post it. What year is this? 2017. I'm you, sorry. No, 2018. YouTube was still kind of gnarly then. It was, yeah, I was, yeah, that was... It's only very recently become, like, <laughs> people put legitimate stuff here. That's kind of what I miss a little bit about YouTube, if I'm being honest. It was just, mm -hmm. like, whatever, right? It's just chaos. And then when people, I think it's honestly people realize the monetization abilities of YouTube, they're like, wait, what? Yep. You know? They started focusing on it a lot, yeah. yeah. And and I'd become so obsessed with that point. At, I'd not even care. I dropped everything else, the social media marketing, everything. I dropped everything for YouTube, and that's where my time went. It wasn't for the money. It was just because I absolutely love to do it. Yeah, and I would create videos like, don't do this if you plan to join the military, F-18, Navy Jet, why I never graduated boot camp, um, which is a, another story. I, I didn't graduate because I had cellulitis in my knee, and I basically they basically just transferred me after I passed battle stations. didn't have a graduation. But, yeah, favorite destination I've ever been in the Navy, things like that, top three things I dislike about the military, very military-centric videos, and I became so obsessed with this, I created 40 videos in 40 days in September of 2018. Mm -hmm. What is the best military haircut? Oh, it's um, low fade, How long, long on, on top? top. Low reg, baby. Yep. Yeah, that's yep. it. Yep, and I would just bring my this camera around. This is why friends. Yeah. I, yeah. I became obsessed with just creating these videos, vlog style, you know, and I had, at the time, I had put, purchased a drone, I mean, on put it on credit, of course, Yeah. and just kind of kept producing. By the end of 2018, I got had my first paycheck from, from Google. It was $31. What did that feel like that first time? Honestly, it was kind of, it wasn't... I was like, okay, uh, cool. 
it was kind of like a slap in the face, you know, 40 videos in 40 days before I even got monetized. If you say four hours editing on those videos and then four hours shooting, that's eight hours. That's 320 hours mm -hmm. for $31. Yeah. That's like 10 cents a video. I mean, 10 cents an hour. <sighs> so, Sounds like TikTok. Um, yeah. So juicy arm workout. Yeah, I, I'd created everything go that I could put think some of. of. Those, go ahead and put some of the ones. You know what I like, Aaron. Go put some of those into the uh, Zach folder if you catch my yeah. drift. Um, juicy arm workout for sure. Full day of eating for fat loss. This is, yeah, back in 2018. And This is when you were competing in bodybuilding too, right? Yeah, I, I did a, I'd done a bodybuilding show. Kind of started to step out. Wanted, to, wanted more of myself. Wanted more out of myself. And you do this. You do this thing that I've always liked. Uh, you embrace hard stuff and stuff that you're not good at. Mm -hmm. And you're like, like you said earlier, like I'm scared of the. What would you say? I'm scared of the water, so I'm going to be a navy diver. That's a crazy way. <laughs> that's a crazy way to get over fears. But I love it. I, I love it. It's uh, yeah. It's resulted in a lot of failures, but overall, it's resulted in a lot of earning. Uh, a lot of. I, I, I'm seeing earnings on there. A lot of lessons learned. Yeah. And well, but you are earning. The thing you earned is that you've learned this trade along the way. And like, we'll, we'll put up clips and everything. And again, like you, you, you know, you know where Austin's channel is. I mean, come on, dude. It's, it's the best Austin Alexander, youtube.com. It's youtube.com is a great website. You guys should check it out. Um, <laughs> what if I was like, youtube.com. Yeah. Youtube.com, uh, Austin Alexander. But, um, I mean, so, Let's just go ahead and give you this. So three years ago, 19 million views. Caitlin Ohashi. How do you say Ohashi? Ohashi. Great person. My youngest daughter who you've met, um, she was like, we were still doing competitive uh, gymnastics at that time, but her video had just come out of her LSU routine. Mm-hmm. Exploded. Most viral video ever. Yeah, exploded because it's a it's a really good routine athletically, the performance, all of it. Mm -hmm. She does incredible at it. And then she's like, Dad, have you heard of this guy? And I had seen you and I, I was following you. And I was like, dude, this is gnarly. This is gnarly. And I was like, dude, my daughter loves your stuff. And then you're like, oh, cool, tell it. And you sent me a video. Yeah. And uh, this was such a cool guy you are. I sent a video like, yeah, me and your dad are friends because we had met by that point at um, – the echelon bravo sierra event mm -hmm. and um like yeah we're, we're friends and like be good to your dad do what he says and like you said something it's like really cool and that put me big time in the house that mm -hmm. gave me so much street cred but good, good you know by that time you'd already started shifting into the op school course stuff but where did that idea come from yeah so so throughout 2018 i kept posting videos in 2019 and got big and that when i was monetized i think i had done like 20 30 million views and in 2019, I had made my Navy salary from YouTube. It was nice. like $65,000. Like, man, this is crazy. Didn't touch any of it. Yeah. Because I was like, this is not real. It was just so good to be true. And I was experiencing that entrepreneurial spirit again. And, you know, that I had experienced in high school with the current events. Yeah. And I was like, man, this is absolutely crazy. I'm doing something part-time that I absolutely love to do and making money from it. And then 2020 shifted around. I had partnered with a an agency called Night Media. I had met Michael Gordon at Night Media. Love the guy, one of my best friends to this day, and manager. And and he's like, yeah, dude, these are you know these are actual earnings. This is your money. And so I, I took that money and I paid off my debt. How did that feel? It was such a. I'm getting chills thinking about it. It was. Knowing that I did that all 100% by myself, the filming, the editing, and then reaping the rewards by paying off that debt, it was like a huge burden was just relieved off of me. It was, 2020 was a, a, a crazy year. That's the year that we filmed with Kaylin Ohashi and just continued to, to, to build and grow, grew the YouTube channel. And by the end of 2020, I had not only maxed my Navy salary, but I had tripled it or quadrupled it. I think I had done a quarter million dollars in 2020 from YouTube. And it was absolutely, you know, crazy. I love this country so much, dude. I Like, yeah, it was a, <laughs> like it was just, a, you can do that. It's just mm -hmm. incredible to me. Mm -hmm. It was, um, it's, it's absolutely crazy. So I never wanted my channel just to be Austin Alexander. I mean, the, the title of my channel is Austin Alexander. So that's where I came up with, you know, I want to, 
I want to build a community that's not just Austin Alexander. Uh-huh. And I don't know what I wanted to call it. Like I had previously tried a, a series called Branch Battles, which is the first, very first iteration of Battle Bunker. Yeah. And then I had tried USS Battle Series, which is where we would promote competitions on these ships. I had partnered with a guy named Cliff and, and we tried creating a few of those videos and Cliff kind of wasn't into it. We had a falling out. I left USS Battle Series mm-hmm. and I said, you know what? I, I, I'm going to try this again myself. And that's where the idea of Battle Bunker came along. And first it was Battle Factory. I said, I'm going to rent a warehouse in Los Angeles and I'm going to build a big gym and we're just going to film videos in it. Well, when the budgeting came in and everything, I realized, hey, Battle Factory is not going to work. Yeah. And plus it was it was already taken by Pokemon. It was trademarked by Pokemon. So I did some more digging and I'm like, not going to win that lawsuit. <laughs> yeah. yeah it, it did not have the funds to do that at all. Yeah. So I typed in factory synonyms on Google and the first one that came up was bunker. And I'm like, battle bunker, battle bunker. They had a military vibe. It had a competitive edge. And I was like, went to the trademark search. It just expired. Nerf owned it. They used to have the bunker battles or whatever. Nerf had let it expire like four months prior. I said, this is my sign from God to trademark Battle Bunker. So I did. Yeah. And then two months later, I had told the Navy, hey, I'm getting out. I'm going to take YouTube full time. Yeah. And they all looked at me like I'm a freaking idiot, of course. Like they should, you know, it's becoming a full time YouTuber is not a common thing. And that's when I started the search for this land to build an obstacle course. Mm -hmm. Obstacle courses were the most successful videos on my channel with Kaylin Hashi and James Charles and the Marine Corps obstacle course. So I said, I'm going to build an obstacle course series and post it on my channel. So that's when I went into pursuit and I, I found a, a plot of 10 acres. I purchased for 10 grand. It fell through. Like it was a big headache. Insurance was a nightmare. And finally I landed on a parcel of 86 acres that I had leased for three grand a month. And that's where I built in November, 2020 on terminal leave. I built the first battle bunker obstacle course. It was nine obstacles. It was like, 250 feet long, really tiny course. Spent a lot of my money to make it happen. And then by the end of December, we had produced our first Battle Bunker episode. It was hosted on my my channel. It was Navy versus Marine Corps. I have so many questions. I'm going to try to remember all of them. Okay. I, I love this. And I'm trying to remember that not everyone has the same, like not everyone knows everything we've talked about. But uh, like... What do you think it is that made the obstacle course stuff so popular in particular? It was the competition. The competition? It, we, had, we had built this, we had kind of fantasized this idea of taking these jobs that um, in occupations like firefighter versus police officer. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. People click on it and they watch it. And it had a very wholesome vibe, you know, two, two three people going head to head, like yeah. competing friendly in a in competition. So yeah. obstacle course is a way that we facilitated that. Yeah, but I mean, I guess it's just, it doesn't, it's, I liked it. I liked the competition, but like, I would have never been like, oh, people want to see people do obstacle courses. But it's because I forget because I've done them and you've done mm-hmm. them. It's just kind of like whatever. But your average person's never like jumped over logs or done like the weave or like all those things because it's, in my opinion, one of the things that makes it so visually rewarding is because it feels a little like nostalgic of being on a playground mm-hmm. and you're competing still because there is competition. But like outside of like what you're doing and a playground, you'll be able to like compete against your, I remember like competing against my friends on like monkey bars, just being like do, 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 or like stuff like that. Yeah. So it feels like a better version of that. Mm-hmm. Right. I, I think that I didn't even know it was going to work. I was, when I built that course, I was like, man, if I spend a lot of money on this, nobody wants to come out, nobody watches the videos, this is going to suck. It was a big leap for me, especially getting out of the Navy at the time. There were some dark times. And I just would always tell myself, Austin, if you build it, they will battle. If you build it, you know, people will come out here and they'll battle each other. And I just said that over and over in my head. And driving out there on terminal leave, I had this sense of of no purpose, like leaving the Navy, not being a, a part of this family anymore. Yeah. And I was out there by myself building and digging and, and I was kind of use it as therapy to build that first obstacle course. And if you click on that U.S. Marine versus U.S. Navy, Eric, and bring that up, you'll get a, a view of the course. It's, yep, that one right there. You'll get a view of the course 
and see like that it really wasn't anything special at all but i had put my heart and soul into it and i had determined that that was the route that i wanted to take look at you and that was out in moore park california no power no water out in the middle of the desert and so a friend of mine angel romero and then ashley they i just had them go head to head and <laughs> just we we fixed it up a little bit put some fancy graphics on it did some interviews and and just produced it and, and had that produced. And let's see, can you scroll down a little bit and see when that was posted? Three years ago. I believe December, December what? What, 20, show it in the more? Yeah, December 3rd, 2020. Yep, December um, 3rd, 2020. Three million views. You might make it. Yep. <laughs> Before that, we had posted three or four Battle Bunker episodes that did not perform at all. And I was like, dang. I was like, this may be going down the drain faster than I thought. But and you then, just felt it, though. Felt I felt it. I was going to keep going and keep pushing. Like, I, I will run myself dry before I quit anything, especially in business. Like, I will try every avenue. I will pivot everything. But we just stuck with it. And, and this video rocketed up. I think this video probably paid for that whole course, which is how YouTube is, is crazy. I think this video probably earned 20 grand, 15 grand. That's awesome. And I said, okay, this is a thing. And we kept producing, kept producing. Shortly after, I had a friend Ken come out. It was a U.S. Marine versus SWAT operator. Yeah. And we kept creating these videos. We created competition, 20, competition, 21 competition. episodes in our first season. Yep. And that's how Battle Bunker came to be. And now when people see Battle Bunker Bus and Hybricon games, like it all started here. This is the hub. And uh, yeah, good times. Is that Ken? Yep, Ken Bradley. Oh, yeah, that was two years ago. Oh, I wish he would arrest me. You know what I mean? That's his his baby mama, soon to be wife now, yeah. Brittany Oldehoff. Yeah, great She's woman. So lucky. If she slips up, I'm telling you. Yeah. I know. Um, <laughs> if, yeah, I hope she treats you right, Ken. Um, yeah. No, dude, one of the one of the best. I I remember. I love this one. I love this this whole little series. Uh -huh. I mean, not series, but like what I love about this in particular. What you I feel you're really able to capture in in this. Let's just call it competitions is the – there are things you do in the military that are mainly just this, right? Like you're just trying to like break off someone and like objectively it's not that hard mm -hmm. of a task to complete. Like take a take a sandbag, put it over your shoulder, run, walk, get to that thing. But it sucks. It sucks. Yes. It sucks. That hill with that 70-pound bag? Yeah. Man. But like you're not, it's not. What I'm saying is like it's not complex, but it's so simple and beautiful mm -hmm. at all at the same time, right? And we also do like the barrel race uh, as well. Like I yep. love it because it's just it's just a mental test. That's the barrel all. Barrel sprint. Yeah, yeah. No, I love it because it feels like something like you know what we should do make these boots do. You know what I mean? That's mm -hmm. that's what it goes back to me. Mm -hmm. But so like the channel's growing, the brand's building, everything's happening. You know, your your facial hair becomes more and more you know, legendary as time goes Thank on. Thank you. But when was the moment that you can recall where you're like, I think we're going to be all right? There, There's not one. You don't, I mean. Nope. You still don't feel that? Nope. Like at all, you're not like Austin, Alexander, the the battle bunker, like we're, we're, we're going to be, not like you're comfortable, but like, okay, there's there's something here. You don't get any of that ever? I am bad about this, and I, I would tell every entrepreneur to steer clear of this. I will rarely stop and smell the roses. I look at the next thing and say, okay, we have to make it here. We have to make it here. But I will say there's one thing. So with Battle Bunker, I never just wanted it to be videos. And so that's why in 2022, mm -hmm. we partnered with the Chula Vista Elite Athlete Training Center. Oh, yeah. And we brought our course to them. We built a brand new 22 obstacle course, cost 100 grand, paid mm -hmm. cash from YouTube yes. earnings. And I was there. The deal was made. Yeah, the you day, were. The day a, the deal was made. My project was still fit. <laughs> yeah, me and, uh, me and Ben Smith and Chris Kellum, we were doing an activation for Amazon mm -hmm. for uh, the terminal list. And so we were yep. getting hazed by Navy SEAL. <laughs> and like the craziest thing ever. You were supposed to be there too. We'd all uh -huh. we'd all interviewed for the same thing. And uh, I'm just sitting there eating in the chow hall and I turn around. I'm like, oh my God, Austin's really here. And that was the day you made the deal with him. Mm -hmm. It was so awesome. That was... Yeah, that was because I met the guy, whatever his name is. Uh, I can't remember it now. Is it Andrew? 
I, th- I think it was. Yeah. And he's like, "Do you know this guy named Austin?" And I was like, "Dude, Austin's the best. If you want to, if you want to, I be think on, that's what sealed the deal, right there." I literally, me and Ben, like, were like, "Dude, if you, he should be here right now." But if, if look at his videos, like, I was literally like, I could, I was exhausted actually. Mm-hmm. I mean, it wasn't. We were out in the field, like doing push up stuff, whatever. But I was like, "Dude, just check this out. Check this out." And like. You know, then to see him, he's like, oh, your boy's really hyping you up. I was like, yeah, dude, Austin's a man, dude, like literally just sending it because like, you know. That helped my case a lot. I appreciate that. Dude, it was you, but you made it easier because again, like this community is so small. There's so many, um, I want veterans to to succeed more than anyone because it is what will help to ensure later generations are successful. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, oftentimes there's a famine mentality there's a, um, um, a kind of a, what am I thinking of? This famine mentality where people don't really feel like they have enough ideas or enough things or whatever. And they kind of, you know, beg, steal and borrow from other things and they just kind of take, but they don't invest, but they don't understand mm-hmm. that we're all each other has. So we have to look out for each other. Mm-hmm. And if we do it right, like we can be like a force for all of us doing good. Like your success doesn't hurt me. It helps me. Because it gives more opportunity to you is they're like companies will look at you and be like, Austin Alexander, his brand is doing good. What about this brand? What about these companies? That's how it works, right? So the more that one person succeeds, the more the whole community succeeds. Mm-hmm. And we need to embrace that more. And I, 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 don't, I don't know. I hope that I've been able to do that in my own way. And I hope that this is one of those things to do that because like we can collab. We can do this. We can do things together. And like it's okay. We can all eat. There's plenty to go around. But – I think we need to embrace that more as a whole. Hundred percent. I, I, there are people out there that are are in for the kill. Like they don't understand that there's room for everyone at the table if you're willing to work hard. Yeah. And they just are just focused on shooting you out of the sky. Like imagine if all the fitness, in, all the military fitness influencers like went to war with each other. Why would that help? All it does is make everyone who's not a military fitness influencer hate military fitness influencers yeah. and then military veterans as a mm-hmm. whole and like whatever, like. That's what people don't get is, like, no one remembers the guy who sucks or gal who sucks. They just remember that, like, all military veteran influencers suck as an example, right? Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, we need more of, like, people working together. And that's that's what's honestly been so cool about the people at, you know, Echelon and and Bravo Sierra. They, they all put us together, like, in a, in a room that I would have never anticipated, you know. Mm-hmm. First time we met was, you know, up at Fort Campbell, me, you, Michael, um, Aaron – Bartell, Demi. yeah, Bartell, Bun, Aaron, Demi. great guy, love Bun, love, yeah. love, love Aaron. Love but when Demi. I think about it, there's no road that I could plan where I'm like, this is where I'll be that day, mm-hmm. you know. But we're all there, you know, mm-hmm. and all the things that have happened afterwards. But it's just I don't know. I'm trying to smell the roses more, and I'm gonna make you smell them too if it kills you. That a boy. I've been stopping lately because I mean the story progresses, and I've learned so much about myself this year. It's been a it's been a tough year this year. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so. And as much as you're willing to talk about it, we can. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm good and I'm, I feel like I'm healed now. And that term is used so much like healing, healing journey, but I'll, I'll talk about mine specifically here in a few minutes. Yeah. We, we made the partnership with the training center. Yeah. And we built a new course in there in order to hold events and everything. And that's when a good friend of mine, great guy, Hunter McIntyre, partnered with, with me for, um, on behalf of Battle Bunker. Yeah. And at this time, you know, Battle Bunker had formed into its uh, official business with Battle Bunker LLC out of state of California mm-hmm. and headquartered in San Diego, Olympic, Olympic Parkway Drive. And we built this course and we hosted our first ever competition. We called it the Battle Bunker Flagship Competition. Coolest thing I've ever been a part of. Thank you very much. Thank like, you. Like, I was, I was in tears just Thank seeing you because I know how hard you work to see down there. It's just... I, I get choked up thinking about it. Thank you. It's, yeah. A lot of people see Battle Bunker now, like they see Battle Bunker Bus, which is what uh, another thing we started um, in uh, twenty twenty mid twenty twenty one, which is like it, the it biggest series. It was the end series. of twenty twenty one because you called me. End of twenty. Yeah, that going December, into twenty twenty. I was in the bed, yeah. Yeah. and you're like, I want to buy a bus and make people do pull ups. Do mm-hmm. it. I was do it, Austin. I'm I'm not taking any form of credit whatsoever. I just remember being. I hung up. I looked at Christy and I go. That's the smartest idea I've ever heard. Mm. That's the smartest idea I've ever heard. And then what? Three months later, you had what? How many views? Well, so as a creator, I'm con- you're constantly monitoring the creative landscape and yeah. short form content was blowing up. TikTok was massive. All the other uh, 
platforms for following. So I was like, we need a vertical series. And that's where I came up with the idea of battle bus. I'm just going to pull up in a random parking lot and have people do pull-ups on the back of this pull-up bar. So I purchased a van. It was a 1989 or 86 Dodge Ram B250. Yeah. I'd wrapped it green. The guy that I paid to wrap it did a half-assed job and I ended up paying him anyways because I'm a nice guy. Anyways, I put Battle Bunker on the side and I would pull up into random gyms and I would we would film these segments. I was giving away a dollar for every pull-up and posted the first few episodes and they didn't really do too well. I kept driving hard with it because I remember, I, you remember me telling me like, I will go broke trying yeah. to make something work. And kept posting three months later. I think we had a video that hit 70 million views and completely changed the whole landscape of, of, of everything for short form. And we just kept doing that. We went to a location a week. I hired a full-time editor at that time. Facebook was paying us like we had injected another twenty to thirty thousand dollars a month from Battle Bunker Bus. That earning, that's why, that's how we're able to give so freely. I was giving away, you know, two or three thousand dollars at each location, just throwing bands at people because yeah. Facebook was paying us so well. Yeah, and I was able to take like save ten, fifteen k a month from Battle Bunker Bus while still doing great in the community and using it as an avenue to promote positivity and fitness. Battle Bus is basically like stand-up comedy with me as the host with a fitness vibe. It's hilarious. I've learned that. Thank you very much. No, it's, it's, and I love it just because I, I know you so well, but I love how you're like, how many can you do? You look, and like, you, you love to poke them. Like the yeah. one guy, what's his name? The celebrity trainer, Mike, uh, Mike Ryan. Mike Ryan, you're like, you look like you can do squats. He goes, yeah, a few. Yeah. <laughs> like, he's like, yeah, yeah a couple. few. And he does what, 100? 100 with a 135. Didn't blink. 56 years young. Yeah, 56 years young. He also mm-hmm. just did a uh, did a video with this guy. What's his name? Um, the Rock. Oh, I know. Yeah, <laughs> like his, yeah. I don't know. I think it might work out. Who knows? But mm-hmm. like, I just love it. I love it. And I just, I just remember like just how, ex- you're like, I think I'm going to do it. And I remember like, that's, that's gnarly. And then it's on ESPN. It's on Sports Center. Like Sports literally, Center, it's ESPN. everywhere. It's now manifested in like, are you the pull up guy? Like it's it's so crazy. So to date, now that series has done three billion views online. We used to do thirty to forty million views per platform per month. Three billion, billion views. views with a B. With a B. A Bezos B. And it's transformed into its own channels now. It has its own Instagram. Uh, the, the Battle Bunker bus has its own personality. Yeah. When I drive around San Diego, people I hear, Arr! and I get mad initially because I'm like, what the hell am I doing? But then yeah. they're just like, Battle Bus guy. Yeah. I get approached in gyms like, hey, you're the Battle Bus guy? I'm like, yeah, I have a name. Do you know my name? They're like, no, but can I get a picture? I'm like, well, sure, I guess. Yeah. My name's Austin. Yeah, my name's Austin. Nice to meet you. I like it. So but all this is happening. This is happening. And, and you're like, I'm moving in this. I love what you do too. Like, you, so you take it, you're taking capital from different projects, moving it in because mm-hmm. you were trying to get to the goal of different buckets, the Hypercon games. Yes. Because right? that's the latest mountain to climb. I don't mm-hmm. want to say the resting, the plateau or resting point because you'll be like, Hypercon games everywhere. I hope, globally. I hope from there. Yeah. I know you will. I know you will. And I'll be there the first time it goes global. I can't wait. Like, super global. We do like a crazy CrossFit style competition. But, um, you know, so, all these things are happening, and then what's, you know, I, so, don't, I don't know how to ease into it. Yeah, no, no, it's okay. It's all right. So Sarah had been with, with me the whole time. Yeah. Like, she was a driving factor behind my success, I believe, because she was just there to push me. Yeah. And we signed this deal with the training center. She had moved all around for me, uh, Long Beach, Anaheim, Simi Valley, and then out Chula Vista. She had worked remotely, and which was a blessing because she could do it from everywhere. And we went into the flagship competition. She was very, very supportive and... And we had grown very close over the last, you know, five years. Mm-hmm. And we had the flagship competition. It was it was great. It was draining for her because I had shit all over the house, like everywhere, you know. And and she was very lenient because she saw that it was my vision. It was my goal. And we had a successful flagship competition. It really built the physical competition style of Battle Bunker. And, and now Battle Bunker has become this, currently it's become this umbrella. We have Hypercon games, we have Battle Bunker Bus, and now we have Battle Bunker Unbroken series, which are, are like the original Battle Bunker yeah. episodes. So this is a popular topic because like I've been out in the public, like Sarah's been in a lot of my YouTube videos and everything. And I made a, a post back in March saying Sarah and I are lo- no longer together. And I never really opened up about it to like, to 
to make it public, but I will now just because I love you and I love this podcast and I want it to succeed. By the way, if you guys are listening, we ask that you leave a, a review and let us know what you think and um, and subscribe. I love you. I love you too. So, and then we just start making out. That would be awesome. We'll say that for after. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sarah had previously, she had had her own things that she was dealing with. Mm -hmm. Very, very warranted. You know, she was navigating the best possible. And she, we had discussion like, you know, I love you. I want to spend forever with you. And, and by the way, y'all, I mean, you're listening to me talk about this. I've gone through an extensive, you know, almost a year long of, of just reflecting and, and, and just kind of healing myself and becoming okay with it all. So if you listen to this, I don't want you to feel sorry for me by any means, but I'm just going to open up a little bit because I'm comfortable with doing so. And I proposed to her December, uh, on new year's that I proposed to her five years later from when I asked her to be my girlfriend, it was on a, on a midnight cruise ship in San Diego. Mm -hmm. And she started, she put the ring on and she wore it one time that night and then she took it off. She said, I don't really feel like this is, this is right. I, f I feel like I should be more excited to wear this ring, Austin. And I said, okay, well, take it off. You don't have to wear it. We don't have to put a title on whatever. We'll just take it a day at a time. And she had been talking about, I want to move back home. I want to move back home. And, you know, I was kind of just adapting, like kind of just vibing. Like I said, I'm, I'm not the type to get mad or angry or overthink things. I hate thoughts of fear or jealousy. Like I absolutely hate it. And I refuse to this day to have those thoughts. If something is causing me stress or drama or anxiety or fear or jealousy, I tend to cut it out. And I did the same thing with her. It, it came around in February. I found out that she was being unfaithful and it was not physically unfaithful. It was kind of just online, you know, unfaithful. And I said, all right, Sarah, you got to go. You can't do this. I want the ring back. And she said, well, can I have some time to get back on my feet? Because a lot of people were saying, oh, you know, you guys are broken up, but you're still together. I let her live in the house with me until July mm -hmm. just to gotta kind of get back on her feet. And, you know, I still cared about her, even though I was doing my best to cut off emotionally from her. I still cared about her and wanted, wanted the best for her. So finally, July 4th came around and she flew out. She flew out to Ohio and that's the last time I've seen her. And we split up and I still have Lucy and Louie, thank goodness. And so that's what happened with the relationship. Sarah, Sarah had become unfaithful and I, I said, this is no longer going to be a thing. I, um, I love you so much and, and thank you for sharing that. Of course. You know, um, I just have to, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. It's just like, I mean, obviously you never anticipated your life getting to a point where it's so profoundly public. Mm -hmm. Um, what has it been like, you know, dealing with this transition from the life together to the life separate? And has it's, it been harder because it's your life has been public for so long? It, it has not been harder because it's been public. Okay. There are some people that will try to poke and say, what happened to Sarah? Where is Sarah? Which is completely warranted because it's public. Yeah. You know, I don't hide anything from the public. It's not like I'm this person offline and I'm this person online. Like, would you agree that I'm the same exact person in person that I am oh, on, yeah. on, in, on YouTube and Instagram, it's, whatever? It's one of the things I like about you. It's how I describe you. Thank you. I was like, he's, that's Austin. Thank you. It's and Austin. I, like, I, your genuineness is one of the things that, like, pulls me towards you, is that your, your um, drive towards authenticity, mm -hmm. which and, is in a world that's fake and filtered and edited and bought and bought, like, you're, you're like, I'm just Austin, and I mm -hmm. love that. Thank you very much. It's one thing I've focused on is, is being authentic. And I put out a video that said, hey, guys, like I know you, you guys have seen Sarah in my, involved in my videos a lot, but she's we're no longer together. And I don't want to speak about specifics. And she's doing great. I'm doing great. I just want to leave it at that. And, you know, we're, we're no longer together. We're, do, we're both doing great. Mm -hmm. um, but something that I did not share with the public was uh, this year in February, March, I had several things had happened. Sarah had split up. Sarah and I had split up things in the business. You know, the reels program was taken away. We lost 20 to 30 grand a month. The training center was coming out hard on me because we weren't meeting our revenue goal. Things just hit me all at once. Usually I'm really good at dealing with stress. You know, I've been on deployments. I've been out in the middle of the ocean with these $6 billion ships. Never really felt the feeling of anxiety before, but I woke up one morning 
did the regular morning routine, walked with Lucy and Louie and sat down to eat. And I felt like this, I felt like I just had this feeling of being enclosed in a box and the walls were closing in, closing in, closing. I was getting squished and I stood up and I kind of just was just trying to move around and make sure I was still existing. And the feeling of impending doom was so sharp. I'd never experienced a panic attack before. I think it was a, a panic attack and I started sweating. Like it's crazy what your brain can do to your body. Your hands start sweating, your feet, your body heats up. Your heart rate is like 120. You know, I wear a garment and I look down and my heart rate was 120, which freaked me out even more. And I felt like I could not continue living. I never thought about hurting myself, but I just said, I cannot live like this. Something has to change. How do I get out of this? And I just was shaking. I remember what an intense feeling of impending doom it was. And I tried to go outside and it was like my body was telling me, do not go outside. This is a dangerous area. So I sat up there and Sarah was like, what's wrong? I said, Sarah, you need to call, call an ambulance, please. I think I'm dying or I think I'm having a heart attack. And, you know, me being this big 6'4", 230 pound guy falling to a panic attack or, or anxiety attack was just something that I'd never experienced before ever. Oh, yeah. It was brutal. I put my head in a pillow. First time I'd ever done any type of breathing. I did four second box breathing until I went to sleep. Three hours later, I woke up. I was feeling the same exact thing. And for four months straight, every single day, I woke up and I would journal how I felt. If you read that journal today, it's the most depressing thing that I have. It's like, woke up this morning, don't really feel like living, felt really depressed, going to keep pushing through. And again, I never thought about hurting myself or you know, hurting others, but it was just this horrible, terrible feeling. But you were hurting yourself. Well, maybe mentally. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Yeah, because like you were keeping it all inside. Yeah. And that's something that I've learned. Like I've never gone through that before at all. Yeah. Subconsciously, my, my subconscious was eating at me. And I didn't know if it was hormones. I didn't know if it was something I was eating. I tried multiple, multiple things. And, you know, this is March... March, April, May, June, July, four months. I had tried cold plunging, uh, sauna, long trail runs. I had tried magnesium, breathing, meditating, everything. And it seemed to help a little bit, but in reality, I was just had come to accept it. I remember I had Ivan and Matt and the whole film crew with me one day and we were driving out to a shoot and I was at a stoplight, I put it in park. And I said, guys, I don't, I can't, I can't do this. Like there was no real danger at all, but my brain was saying escape. I said, I need to go back to the house and I just feel like I'm going to lose control of this, of this vehicle. So I did a U-turn. I drove back to the house and I just put my head in a pillow while everybody was waiting on me to, to shoot and film. I just put my head in a pillow and breathed it out. And I said, okay, you're going to do this regardless of what happens. You're going to do this. I went out I pushed through it and, and keep and keeping to push through those situations. Like I traveled to regionals in North Carolina with Battle Bunker, some a massive initiative that Battle Bunker was having, all these people depending on me. I was a live stream host, but at the same time dealing with those feeling, feelings of impending doom every single day. And the minute Sarah moved out, it was like 50% gone. So I, I think subconsciously, you know, even though I was telling myself, I was telling everybody, yeah, I'm good. I'm over her. Like, this is great. Subconsciously, I wasn't. And when she left, it was like kind of just it vanished. Like I still had feelings of anxiety and, and depression, but I was riding this high of like signing deals and the, and and Hypercon games coming up in, in regionals and the, just everything doing so well and the Army Project and, and the Navy SEAL Project setting revenue records on YouTube. Like all these things were happening to me that were good on the business side, but my personal life was in shambles. <laughs> and it's kind of crazy for me to talk about now because I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if, it was a, if, it, if, I was, if this was normal. I didn't know if it was a hormone imbalance, but I knew that it was just a terrible feeling almost unbearable. And, and in July, it kind of started to ease up. And I was just flying here on the flight today. 
Yeah, I had a, another panic attack on a plane back mid-March when I was going to my buddy's bachelor party in Chicago. I felt like I need to escape, like I can't be here on this plane. Like I was sweating. I was doing everything I could to, to fake like I was all right on that plane. So I kind of just shut it off and just breathed through, through it. But on the way over here, I sat on the plane. I said, man, I'm the luckiest guy in the entire world. I feel great. I have friends that love me. I have, you know, developed so many strong relationships over this year. And it's been a tough year, but we fought through it. I mean, we signed, we, we signed deals with partners for the Hybricon Games. We did a massive project with the Army. We set revenue records on YouTube. We set revenue records on Facebook, set revenue records on Snapchat. We set brand deal records. We set multiple things in the business. Like I took over as co-founder for a great company called Operation Good Boy. Like all these things happened to me this year that were just so good. But at the same time, like when they were happening, I was losing it on the personal side and it was fucking tough. And I have not cried until my, uh, since my parents got a divorce in 2011. I don't think I'm going to cry right now, but you probably see a few tears in my eyes. Um, fucking me up, man. I've just, I'm just so fucking proud of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I don't want to fucking cry either. Man, you're going to make me cry. Don't do it. Don't do it. So I was so worried about you. I, I had called you several times and I had, you know, you know, and let like you know. I was just so, I was just so fucking worried about you, you know, and like, you know, cause you, you were doing so much and, uh, you know, I just, I remember talking, like, I was like talking to Chrissy. I was like, I'm, I don't know how to be there for him in the best way. And I'm trying to, but like. But I, I know you enough to know that like your head your head was down you were move you were moving through the objective, and I was like if this is how I, this is how I can hold space for him you know this is like this is this is what I'm gonna do right I'm just gonna be here for him and let and just fucking bother him because you know you're not just the guy on the channel you're the, you're the guy. Ivan do this, Matt do that. Like you're you're directing your own the calls. I like mm -hmm. you you just mentioned like so many fucking cool things. And I was just so worried. Ah, fuck, dude. This is the first time <laughs> I've ever cried. I don't give well, a shit. I, I knew that you were there for me and I sensed that. And if I ever ever thought about hurting myself, which I encourage you guys to do, if you ever have the feelings of, of thoughts of suicide or, or hurting yourself or others, reach out and, and talk to people. Like people like Zach are the reason that I was able to continue. I knew I had people in my corner and I, I didn't want to let you guys down. Like a whole team of people, you, Michael, my manager, Michael, Ivan, Matt McDonough, you know, Riley, T. Jack, like all these people that were in my corner cheering for me. And that was my support system. It's fucking beautiful. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's just, huh, um, Like, I, I usually ask people what I want them to take away from this or what I want you, them to take away from you, but I don't, I don't know. I, I, that would fall short right now. Um, but as you think about the past six months alone and everything, like, what's your biggest takeaway? Because at the same time where you're negotiating a deal with, like, sandwich companies and doing firehouse these subs. things firehouse subs yeah. i just didn't know if we could say it firehouse sub. you're talking to firehouse subs like all these different things are happening like you're like basically i mean what is it divorce death all these things. like mm. so those are the top there's like the top three things and that's one of them um i just i just can't imagine it but like what what's your takeaway how do you i don't know man like well i'll kind of help you facilitate this life can change in an instant and us being out there just like everyone you know if you're shooting for a goal or one wanting a raise or whatever you're putting yourself out there and you're trying to achieve more even if it's something as small as you know going to the gym and and being around people that you're not comfortable um you know working out in front of or whatever if you're pushing outside of your comfort zone you you are are putting yourself out out there and you're we're constantly susceptible 
to change and to stress and anxiety. But I read a quote the other day that if you are going through stress or anxiety, it's, it's normal and it just means that you are alive and chances are it means that you are stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something for, for the ones in your life that you love or for yourself. So if anybody's listening to this out there, if it's, you take one thing away from this, it's feelings of stress and anxiety. They are just feelings. They are normal for humans to experience and they should never dictate what you do physically, or they should never dictate thoughts of, of hurting yourself or hurting others. They are very temporary. Life can change bad just as fast as it can change good. At the same time, this year I was so conflicted because all these great things were happening, but at the same time, all these bad things were happening. I had never had things in my life clash like that. And it was so... It was such an emotional roller coaster that I had learned to understand like things will happen, bad things will happen, good things will happen, and it's all temporary. It really is because things change. Things change rapidly and they change all the time. So don't ever let the situation that you're in. be a determining factor for the, for the way that you live the rest of your life. And if that's thoughts of, of taking your life, just remember these feelings are temporary and they will go away. Use your support system. Reach out. Do not be afraid to, to speak to people. Even though I didn't make my battles public, I had people in my corner like Zach, like Michael, and, and people that I could talk to, my, my parents especially, my mom and my dad knew exactly what I was going through. And so did my grandparents. You know, I, I made it known, hey, I was struggling. And, and never, never think for a second that you don't have a support system. There's somebody in your life you can talk to, for sure. Just remember that. Just remember that. Austin, I love you. I love you too. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. If you build it, they will battle. If you build it, they will battle, baby. We're still building. Yes, we are. Every single day. Thanks. Subscribe to the podcast, y'all. Click the, click the subscribe button and click the leave a review, leave a nice comment that says, hey, I love you, Zach. Talk to you guys later. Later.